Hello, I'm Jody Swear Deferia for Amazon Web Services Training and Certification. Welcome to Cloud Practitioner Essentials. This course is intended for individuals who seek an overall understanding of the AWS Cloud independent of specific technical roles. It provides a detailed overview of cloud concepts, AWS services, security, architecture, pricing, and support. Upon completion of this course, learners should be able to define what the AWS cloud is and the basic global infrastructure, describe the key services on the AWS platform and their common use cases, describe basic AWS cloud architectural principles, describe basic security and compliance aspects of the AWS platform and the shared security model, Define the billing, account management, and pricing models. Identify sources of documentation or technical assistance. Describe the AWS Cloud value proposition. And describe basic core characteristics of deploying and operating in the AWS Cloud. This is an entry-level course, but it assumes that learners have general IT technical knowledge, and general IT business knowledge. This course is delivered through a series of short video modules and knowledge assessments and will take approximately six hours to complete. Cloud Practitioner Essentials is comprised of this overview, five content modules, bonus material, and a course summary. In Section 1, we cover AWS Cloud concepts. This includes Introduction to Cloud and Introduction to the AWS Cloud. In Section 2, we cover AWS Core Services. This is comprised of an overview of services and categories, Introduction to the AWS Global Infrastructure, Amazon VPC, Security Groups, Amazon EC2, Amazon Elastic Block Store, Amazon S3, and AWS Database Solutions. In Section 3, we cover AWS Security. This includes Introduction to AWS Security, the AWS Shared Responsibility Model, AWS Access Control and Management, AWS Security Compliance Programs, and AWS Security Resources. In Section 4, we cover AWS Architecting. This includes an introduction to the well-architected framework, reference architecture, fault tolerance and high availability, and reference architecture, web hosting. In Section 5, we cover AWS Pricing and Support. This includes Fundamentals of Pricing, Pricing details for Amazon EC2, Amazon S3, Amazon EBS, Amazon RDS, and Amazon CloudFront. The TCO Calculator Overview, and AWS Support Plans Overview. In Bonus Materials, this course includes bonus material in the form of several supplementary videos that reinforce what you've learned in this course. I hope you enjoy this learning experience. For Amazon Web Services Training and Certification, I'm Jody Suera Deferia. Hi, my name is Jody Suero de Feria for Amazon Web Services Training and Certification. Today I'll be giving you an introduction to AWS Cloud. Since this course is about becoming a cloud practitioner, let's start by defining cloud computing. Cloud computing refers to the on-demand delivery of IT resources and applications 
via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Before cloud computing, you would have to provision capacity based on guessing theoretical maximum peaks. If you didn't meet your projected maximum peaks or exceeded them, you would be paying for expensive resources that would stay idle or have insufficient capacity to meet your needs, in addition to the overhead of real estate, power, and cooling. On the other hand, with AWS, servers, databases, storage, and higher level application components can be initiated within seconds. You can treat these as temporary and disposable resources, free from the inflexibility and constraints of a fixed and finite IT infrastructure. By harnessing the power of AWS Cloud, your approach to change management, testing, reliability, and capacity planning is more agile and efficient. One main reason companies are moving to the cloud is increased agility. There are three factors that influence agility. Speed, experimentation, and culture of innovation. Let's take a closer look at how these factors enable organizations to be more agile by harnessing the power of cloud computing. With AWS facilities all over the world, we can offer you global reach with a moment's notice. It's cost prohibitive to put your data centers where your customers are. However, with AWS, you get the benefit without having to make the huge investment. In cloud computing, new resources are only a click away, which means you reduce the time it takes to make those resources available to your developers from weeks to just minutes, resulting in a dramatic increase in agility for the organization. Another agility benefit of cloud computing is being able to experiment more often. AWS enables operations as code in the cloud, and the ability to safely experiment, develop operations procedures, and practice failure. For example, with AWS you can spin up servers in minutes for experimenting, return or repurpose servers for other experiments. With virtual and automatable resources, you can quickly carry out comparative testing using different types of instances, storage, or configurations. Using AWS CloudFormation enables you to have consistent, templated sandbox development, test, and production environments with increasing levels of operations control. As I just mentioned, cloud computing allows you to experiment quickly and with low cost and low risk. This is great for IT because it allows for more experimentation more often, which leads to the discovery of new configurations and innovations. In order to understand how AWS utilizes the agility of cloud computing, we have to look at the AWS infrastructure that supports elasticity, scalability, and reliability of computing resources. AWS cloud infrastructure is built around regions and availability zones. A region is a physical location in the world where we have multiple availability zones. Availability zones consist of one or more discrete data centers, each with redundant power, networking, and connectivity housed in separate facilities. Availability zones offer you the ability to operate production applications and databases which are more highly available, fault tolerant, and scalable than would be possible from a single data center. Fault tolerance refers to the ability for a system to remain operational even if some of the components of that system fail. It can be seen as the built-in redundancy of an application's components. High availability ensures that your systems are always functioning and accessible and that downtime is minimized as much as possible without the need for human intervention. By utilizing the AWS Cloud, you can take advantage of a scalable, reliable, and secure global computing infrastructure to best meet your requirements. In relation to agility, elasticity is also a powerful force in cloud computing. Elasticity is the power to scale computing resources up or down easily, while only paying for the actual resources used. The elastic nature of AWS allows customers to quickly deploy new applications, instantly scale up as the workload grows, 
instantly shut down resources that are no longer required. Scale down and not pay for the infrastructure. Whether you need one virtual server or thousands, whether you need computing resources for a few hours or 24-7, AWS provides the elastic infrastructure to meet your needs. One of the key benefits of AWS is the ability to use services at your own pace. By using AWS, customers can grow, shrink, and adapt their consumption of services to meet seasonal requirements, launch new services or products, or simply accommodate new strategic directions. AWS delivers a scalable cloud computing platform designed for high availability and dependability, providing the tools that enable you to run a wide range of applications. Using AWS tools, auto-scaling and elastic load balancing, your applications can scale up or down based on demand. Backed by Amazon's massive infrastructure, you have access to compute and storage resources when you need them. With AWS, you can easily deploy your system in multiple regions around the world while providing a lower latency and better experience for your customers at minimal cost. Thanks to the efficiencies of scale that AWS enjoys, customers can consistently use innovative services and cutting-edge technology without having to go through multiple procurement cycles and expensive evaluations. AWS provides capabilities to support virtually any workload. This level of innovation gives customers continued access to the latest technology. It's also important to note that you retain complete control and ownership over which region in which your data is physically located, making it easy to meet regional compliance and data residency requirements. Before cloud computing, infrastructure security auditing would often be a periodic and manual process. The AWS Cloud instead provides governance capabilities that enable continuous monitoring of configuration changes to your IT resources. AWS also offers industry-leading capabilities across facilities, networks, software, and business processes to meet the strictest security requirements. AWS's world-class, highly secure data centers use state-of-the-art electronic surveillance and multi-factor access control systems. Data centers are staffed 24 by 7 by trained security guards and access is authorized strictly on a least privileged basis. Environmental systems are designed to minimize the impact of disruptions to operations. Multiple geographic regions and availability zones allow you to remain resilient in the face of most failure modes, including natural disasters or system failure. Since AWS assets are programmable resources, your security policy can be formalized and embedded with the design of your infrastructure. Using AWS helps customers develop high-performing and reliable solutions to address most business needs. Whether you are offering media services to customers around the world or managing medical devices for a highly decentralized workforce, AWS gives customers the tools to implement solutions quickly and with limited friction. Reliability at AWS is defined as the ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service failures. It also focuses on the ability of dynamically acquiring computing resources to meet demand and mitigate disruptions. In order to achieve reliability, your architecture and system must have a well-planned foundation in place that can handle changes on demand and also detect failure and automatically heal itself. By using AWS, organizations can achieve greater flexibility and capacity, reducing the uncertainty of forecasting hardware needs. Additionally, the scale of AWS gives customers capacity and reliability that is difficult to match by on-premises solutions. Unless you're in the business of building data centers, you have likely spent too much time and money doing just that. With AWS, you no longer need to dedicate valuable resources to building costly infrastructure, including purchasing servers, software licenses, or leasing facilities. By paying for services on an as-needed basis, you can redirect your focus to innovation and invention, reducing procurement complexity and enabling your business to be fully elastic. Pay-as-you-go pricing allows you to easily adapt to changing business needs without overcommitting budgets and improving your responsiveness to changes. 
With a pay-as-you-go model, you can adapt your business depending on need and not on forecasts, reducing the risk of over-provisioning or missing capacity. Moving to the cloud is not just about saving costs on IT anymore. It's about creating the environment that lets your business thrive. The digital revolution has made it easier than ever to connect with customers, develop groundbreaking new insights and scientific breakthroughs, and deliver innovative new products and services. Amazon Web Services offers a broad set of global, cloud-based products including compute, storage, databases, analytics, networking, mobile, developer tools, management tools, IoT, security and enterprise applications. These services help organizations move faster, lower IT costs, and scale. AWS is trusted by the largest enterprises and the hottest startups to power a wide variety of workloads including web and mobile applications, game development, data processing and warehousing, storage, archive, and many others. When you use the AWS cloud, you clear away obstacles to innovation like high costs and long-term contracts, and you can take advantage of our services, a broader partner ecosystem, and continued innovation to drive business solutions and grow your business. With our global footprint and our expertise in creating technology that enables business innovation, you can trust AWS to deliver a solution that will help your business succeed. For Amazon Web Services Training and Certification, I'm Jody Swerdeferia. Hi, I'm Mike Blackmer for Amazon Web Services Training and Certification. In this module, we'll cover the services and categories for AWS and a little bit about AWS documentation. AWS offers a broad set of global cloud-based products that can be used as building blocks for common cloud architectures. There are many different services that each product offers. Some of the categories we'll discuss in this module include compute, storage, databases, networking, and security. Let's take a moment to look at each of these categories. Now what I've done is open a browser to aws.amazon.com. This is our front page. If I scroll down a little bit, you can see this section called Explore Our Products, and it places all of the products and services into different categories. So for example, if I click on Compute, I can see Amazon EC2, as the first on the list, but a lot of other products and services that show up in the compute category. If I were to click on Amazon EC2, it brings you to the Amazon EC2 main page, which happens to have the URL aws.amazon.com slash EC2. And it gives you a little bit of a, it gives you kind of an opening statement about the product, a more detailed description, and it lists some of the benefits. Additionally, along this row, we can see product details, instance types, pricing, getting started, frequently asked questions, and other resources. So if I click on product details, you get some more information about EC2 functionality. So I'm going to go back to that front page and click on storage. And under storage, we can see Amazon S3, Amazon EBS, and so forth. Lots of other storage options would appear here. Under database, we can see Aurora, RDS, DynamoDB, Redshift, and some of the other options. Now, if we want to find Amazon VPC, it actually shows up under compute because it is a, a required component in order to isolate your compute resources. And it shows up under networking and content delivery 
Amazon VPC. And if we go to Security, Identity, and Compliance, we can see AWS Identity and Access Manager. And clicking on that can give us some more information there. But what I'd like to do now is uh, talk about documentation, and it, this is really well documented. So I can scroll up to the top, and instead of uh, exploring the products, we can go right into More and Documentation, and we can get end user documentation for any product. If you notice, I have not logged into the console, so I'm accessing this just as a public user, Amazon EC2, and you have all the documentation, user guide for Linux, for Windows, the API reference, the CLI reference. This is uh, fantastic stuff here. And this is going to be available for uh, pretty much anything that we have. So now in the documentation, I can select products, uh, storage, S3, select documentation, getting started guide, developer guide, and so forth. Presentation was really a, a way to introduce you to the categories and services that are available on AWS and show you how to get more information by going to aws.amazon.com. For AWS Training and Certification, I'm Mike Blackman. Hi, I'm Anna Fox for Amazon Web Services Training and Certification. Today, I'll be giving you a brief introduction into the AWS Global Infrastructure. AWS's Global Infrastructure can be broken down into three topics. Regions, Availability Zones, and Edge Locations. So let's get started with Regions. Here we are at the AWS homepage, and if we scroll to the middle, we'll see a map of the global networks of regions and edge locations. You might be asking, what are regions exactly? Regions are geographic areas that host two or more availability zones. So when you're building and choosing your custom services and features, you have the opportunity to choose in what geographical region your information will be stored. When doing so, it's really important to consider which region will help you optimize latency while minimizing costs and adhering to whatever regulatory requirements you may have. So let's dive deeper here on this point. If you are leveraging cloud computing services, you can easily deploy your applications in multiple regions. For instance, you can have an application in a region near your headquarters, such as San Diego, and then also have a deployable application in a region in the East Coast. Let's say your largest customer base is located in Virginia. Within a few clicks of your mouse, you can easily deploy in the US East region to provide a better customer experience. You'll be optimizing latency and increasing agility for your organization within minutes and with minimal cost. Regions are completely separate entities from one another and resources in one region are not automatically replicated to other regions. So let's expand on this. You'll see a Learn More link. Let's go ahead and click that. Now that we're on the Global Infrastructure page, let's scroll. You'll find a link that says See Detailed List of Offerings at All AWS Locations. This will take you to our region table. Here you can sort through Americas, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and finally Asia Pacific. You will also notice that the table is broken down even more into specific locations and what services are offered there. Next, let's talk about Availability Zones. Availability Zones, or AZs, are a collection of data centers within a specific region. Each are isolated from one another, but yet are connected together by a fast, low-latency link. So what exactly is the benefit of having the Availability Zones isolated yet connected? Good question. When common points of failure occur, it does not affect all of your availability zones because they're isolated. How are they exactly isolated? Well, each availability zone is a physically distinct, independent infrastructure. They are also physically and logically separate. Each zone has their own discrete, uninterruptible power supply, on-site backup generators, cooling equipment, and networking and connectivity. 
They are all supplied via different grids from independent utility companies, as well as connected through multiple Tier 1 transit providers. Isolating them protects from failures and other AZs and ensure high availability and makes it possible for other AZs to handle requests. AWS's best practice is to provision your data amongst multiple AZs. Finally, let's go over edge locations. AWS Edge Locations hosts a content delivery network, or CDN, called Amazon CloudFront. CloudFront is used to deliver content to your customers. Requests for content are automatically routed to the nearest edge location so that the content is delivered faster to the end users. Utilizing the global network of edge locations and regions, you have access to quicker content delivery. Edge locations are typically located in highly populated areas, similarly to regions and availability zones. For a full list of locations, you can always visit aws.amazon.com forward slash cloudfront forward slash details. Let's go over what we discussed today. We introduced AWS's global infrastructure consisting of regions, availability zones, and edge locations. We also briefly discussed that regions break down into two or more availability zones. Also, availability zones are a collection of data centers in a region. And finally, we discussed how edge locations host a content delivery network to deliver content to the customers. For more detailed information on any of the topics we covered today, you can visit aws.amazon.com. For Amazon Web Services training and certification, I'm Anna Fox. Hello. My name is Kent Rademacher, and I will be the instructor for this module. I'm currently a senior technical trainer for AWS and teach architecting on AWS and system operations on AWS. In this module, you will learn about Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or Amazon VPC. I will first introduce this service, followed by a feature review of Amazon VPC. We will then walk through an example Amazon VPC configuration utilizing the features previously discussed. Finally, we will summarize and cover next steps for further learning about Amazon VPC. The AWS Cloud offers pay-as-you-go, on-demand compute, as well as managed services, all accessible via the web. These compute resources and services must be accessible via normal IP protocols implemented with familiar network structures. Customers need to adhere to networking best practices, as well as meet regulatory and organizational requirements. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, VPC, is the networking AWS service that will meet your networking requirements. Amazon VPC allows you to create a private network within the AWS Cloud that uses many of the same concepts and constructs as an on-premise network. But as we shall see later, much of the complexity of setting up a network has been abstracted without sacrificing control, security, and usability. Amazon VPC also gives you complete control of the network configuration. Customers can define normal networking configuration items such as IP address spaces, subnets, and routing tables. This allows you to control what you expose to the Internet and what you isolate within the Amazon VPC. You can deploy your Amazon VPC in a way to layer security controls in the network. This includes isolating subnets, defining access control lists, and customizing routing rules. You have complete control to allow and deny both incoming and outgoing traffic. Finally, there are numerous AWS services that deploy into your Amazon VPC that then inherit and take advantage of the security that you have built into your cloud network. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, VPC, is an AWS foundational service and integrates with numerous AWS services. For instance, Amazon Elastic Cloud Compute, EC2, instances are deployed into your Amazon VPC. Similarly, Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS, database instances deploy into your VPC where the database is protected by the structure of the network, just like your on-premise network. 
understanding and implementing Amazon VPC will allow you to fully use other AWS services. Let's take a look at the features of Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, VPC. Amazon VPC builds upon the AWS global infrastructure of Regions and Availability Zones, or AZs, and allows you to easily take advantage of the high availability provided by the AWS cloud. Amazon VPCs live within regions and can span across multiple AZs. Each AWS account can create multiple VPCs that can be used to segregate environments. A VPC defines an IP address space that is then divided by subnets. These subnets are deployed within availability zones, causing the VPC to span AZs. You can create many subnets in a VPC, though fewer is recommended to limit the complexity of the network topology, but this is totally up to you. You can configure route tables for your subnets to control the traffic between subnets and the Internet. By default, all subnets within a VPC can communicate with each other. Subnets are generally classified as public or private, with public having direct access to the Internet and private not having direct access to the Internet. For a subnet to be public, we need to attach an Internet gateway to the VPC and update the route table of the public subnet to send non-local traffic to the Internet gateway. EC2 instances also need a public IP address to route to an Internet gateway. Let's design an example Amazon Virtual Private Cloud that we can use to start deploying compute resources and AWS services. We'll create a network that supports high availability and uses multiple subnets. First, since VPCs are region-based, we need to select a region. I've selected the Oregon region. Next, I'll create the VPC. I'll give it a name, Test VPC. And I'll define the IP address space for the VPC. The 10.0.0.0/16 is the classless interdomain routing format and means that I have over 65,000 IP addresses to use in the VPC. Next, I create a subnet named subnet A1 and I have assigned an IP address space that contains 256 IP addresses. Also, I specify that this subnet will live in availability zone A. Next, I create another subnet called subnet B1. Assign an IP address space, but this contains 512 IP addresses. I've added an internet gateway called test IGW, Subnet A1 will become a public subnet where non-local traffic is routed through the Internet Gateway. B1 will be our private subnet that is isolated from the Internet. Let's summarize what we have accomplished and review some next steps. We have learned about and how to create VPCs, Internet Gateways, and subnets. Next steps include learning about other B VPC features such as routing tables, VPC endpoints, and peering connections. Also, you can learn about deploying AWS resources into your VPC. More information is available at aws.amazon.com slash VPC. I hope you learned a little something and will continue to explore other videos. I'm Kent Rademacher with AWS Training and Certification. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Anna Fox with Amazon Web Services Training and Certification, and today we'll be talking a little bit about AWS's security groups. Security of the AWS cloud is one of Amazon Web Services' highest priorities, and we provide many robust security options to help you secure your data in the AWS cloud. One of the features I want to talk about today is security groups. At AWS, security groups will act like a built-in firewall for your virtual servers. With these security groups, you have full control on how accessible your instances are. At the most basic level, it's just another method to filter traffic to your instances. 
It provides you control on what traffic you want to allow or deny. To determine who has access to your instances, you would configure a security group rule. Rules can vary from keeping instances completely private, totally public, or somewhere in the middle. Here's an example of a classic AWS multi-tier security group. In this architecture, you will notice that multiple different security group rules have been created to accommodate this multi-tiered web architecture. If you started the web tier, you will see that we have set up a rule to accept traffic from anywhere on the internet on port 80 slash 443 by selecting the source of 0.0.0.0/0. Next, if we move to the app tier, there is a security group that only accepts traffic from the web tier. And similarly, the database tier can only accept traffic from the app tier. Finally, you will notice that there has also been a rule created to allow administration remotely from the corporate network over SSH port 22. So let's take a look at creating a security group. Here I am logged into the AWS Management Console, and I'm going to click EC2. In the navigation pane, under Network and Security, we see Security Groups. Let's go ahead and click that. Now we will see a list of security groups that belong to the account. To create a security group, we want to click Create Security Group. A pop-up will appear, and in this window you'll notice that you can create a name, a description, and finally attach it to a source. Next, if we go down here to the rules, by default, all inbound traffic is denied and all outbound traffic is allowed. If you want to edit this, you can here by clicking the inbound tab and the outbound tabs to adjust your rules. You can edit by traffic type, protocols, port ranges, and source. Best practice is really to figure out what traffic is required for your instance and specifically only allow that traffic. All right, so let's go over what we discussed today. AWS provides virtual firewalls that can control traffic for one or more instances, and they are called security groups. You can control accessibility to your instances by creating security group rules. These security groups can be managed on the AWS Management Console. For more detailed information on security groups, you can visit aws.amazon.com. For Amazon Web Services Training and Certification, I'm Anna Fox. Welcome to this introduction to AWS Compute Services. My name is Alan Goldberg, and I'm a Technical Program Manager here with Amazon Web Services. Building and running your business starts with compute. Whether you are building mobile apps or running massive clusters to sequence the human genome, AWS has a broad catalog of compute services. Everything from simple application services to flexible virtual servers and even serverless computing. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to our compute services. Running servers on-premise is an expensive undertaking. Hardware needs to be procured, often based upon project plans, not the reality of usage. Data centers are expensive to build, staff, and maintain. You need to provision resources for the worst case. Your servers need to be able to handle traffic spikes and events. Once built out, you often have capacity lying idle. AWS offers flexibility and cost-effectiveness. With AWS, you can scale your compute needs to your workload. Scalability is built into our compute services so that as demand increases, you can easily scale up. When demand drops, say at night or on weekends, you can scale down to save money and resources. You don't need to pay for what you're not using. Computing needs may change over time, and our EC2 service, for example, offers a wide variety of virtual server instance types appropriate for everything from simple web servers to large machine learning clusters. You are not locked into specific hardware configurations that you purchased and can easily change instance types. Amazon EC2 allows you complete flexibility to run applications at any scale. You maintain complete control over your environment, and unlike an on-premise environment, with on-demand pricing, you can cost-effectively scale resources up and down to meet your needs. 
Oftentimes, you don't need to run a server. What if instead of running servers, you could just run your application when needed? AWS Lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. You pay only for the compute time you consume. There's no charge when your code's not running. With Lambda, you can run code for virtually any type of application or backend service, mobile, IoT, streaming service, all with zero administration. For example, say I want to process an uploaded image. I can upload the image to Amazon S3 and use an event trigger to launch a Lambda function to process that image without having to have an idle server standing by. Think about it. Running compute without having to provision and maintain servers. If you need to run a simple website or e-commerce applications, AWS offers LightSail. With LightSail, you can launch a virtual private server in just minutes and easily manage simple web and application servers. LightSail includes everything you need to jumpstart your project, a virtual machine, SSD-based storage, data transfer, DNS management, and a static IP address for a low predictable price. Do you use container services on premise? Amazon EC2 Container Service, ECS, is a highly scalable, high-performance container management service that supports Docker containers and allows you to easily run applications on a managed cluster of Amazon EC2 instances. Amazon ECS eliminates the need for you to install, operate, and scale your own cluster management infrastructure. AWS offers multiple compute products allowing you to deploy, run, and scale your applications as virtual servers, containers, or code. We have services for automating and scaling batch processing, running and managing web applications, and creating virtual networks. Additional information about AWS Compute Services is available at aws.amazon.com slash products slash compute. We also have a full set of service level introductions available for you to learn the details of each of these services. Hi, I'm Mike Blackmer. I work for AWS Training and Certification as a curriculum developer. I'm presenting the Amazon EC2 overview. I'll start by showing you some basic facts about the product, then deliver a demonstration that shows you how to build and configure an Amazon EC2 instance. First off, what is EC2? It stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. Compute refers to the compute or server resources that are being presented. There's a lot of different fun and exciting things you can do with servers. Cloud refers to the fact that these are cloud-hosted compute resources. And Elastic refers to the fact that if properly configured, you can increase or decrease the amount of servers required by an application automatically according to the current demands on that application. But let's stop calling them servers and use the proper name of Amazon EC2 instances. Instances are pay-as-you-go. You only pay for running instances and only for the time that they're running. There is a broad selection of hardware and software and selection of where to host your instances. There's a lot more to it than just that. For more information, go to aws.amazon.com slash ec2. Now I'd like to demonstrate how to build and configure an EC2 instance. And during the process of that, I'd like to get into some of the detail of the topics that we've covered so far. During the demonstration, we log into the AWS console, choose a region where we're going to host our instance, Launch the EC2 wizard, select the AMI, which stands for Amazon Machine Image, providing us with a software platform for our instance. Then we'll select the instance type, referring to the hardware capabilities. Then we'll configure network, configure storage, and finally configure key pairs, which will allow us to connect to the instance after we launch and connect to it. I've already logged into the console. My first choice is to choose the region where the EC2 instance will be hosted. Right now it's set for Oregon, which happens to be close by. 
Click on the drop down list and I could choose from any of these other regions, but I'll leave it at Oregon. Now let's go ahead and click on services, EC2, and click launch instance. The first selection criteria is the Amazon machine image, and that refers to the software load that will come with the instance once it's launched. Quick Start gives you a list of a variety of Linux and Windows servers. There's also a marketplace with third-party images, and my AMIs in case you've built some of your own. We're going to select the Amazon Linux AMI. The next screen gives us the hardware selection. They're called instance types. And we can scroll down and see a large list of things from 8 core, 32 gigs of memory, 64 cores. There's a broad variety here. We're going to go low end just for the demonstration and choose the T2 micro instance type. Next, we'll choose configure instance details. I do have the option to create tons of images that will share the same hardware and software build. Seems like we're limited to 100,000. You know what? I want to keep my job, so I'm going to select one. We'll build one instance. Scrolling down, here is where we'll configure the network configuration. And here we're going to stick with the default. The default virtual private cloud and the default subnet and the default auto assign settings, which will give us a DHCP address. We skip down. Everything else looks pretty good, so next we'll add storage. I can increase the size of the root volume, make that a 12 gig volume. I can change the type of disk, keep that. And I can also add a new volume, and we'll make that 16, just to keep things interesting. Also, I want this volume to be deleted if and when we choose to terminate or delete the instance. Next, we'll add tags. By default, an EC2 instance is given a rather cryptic identifier, so we want to give it a friendly name. So click Add Tag, Name, and Value of, I'll just call it EC2 Demo. I'll even make it actually say EC2 Demo. Next, we'll configure security group. A security group is a set of firewall rules. It automatically creates a default rule for SSH connectivity. And I can go ahead and add another rule to allow for simple web connectivity. And I might want to give it a simple name like SSH HTTP, so I know exactly what this security group provides. Now I click Review and Launch provides us with an overview reminding us of our selections. It all looks like what I planned. And now I click Launch. And now in order to connect to the system using SSH, I need to create a key pair. So I click Create a New Key Pair, call it EC2 Demo, and download the private key. Save it locally, and that key is absolutely required in order to connect over SSH. And now the magic button to launch the instance. It's been successfully initiated. Things look good in the launch log. By the way, there's that cryptic identifier. I clicked on that. There's my friendly name. And it says the instance state is pending. You can click on the refresh button and now it's running. That's terrific. Now that we've built it, let's try to access it. I highlight the instance, and down below under description, I can find the public DNS and public IP address of the instance. So I'm going to copy that, launch PuTTY, and the default user is ec2-user. So do EC2 user at, paste in the DNS, and I'll click open. Cache that local key. Oh, it doesn't work because I haven't configured the private key yet. So I'll create a new session with the same information. And now I'll select SSH and auth, 
and browse for that private key. I saved it to this folder here, and it's not there. PuTTY on Windows requires a PPK file. So I need to open another application, it's very simple, called PuttyGen. Click Load. Get to the right folder. Make sure we can see that there's the PEM file. Select that and save the private key. And this will save it as a PPK file. And there it is under the PuTTY selection window. And now, when I open the connection, it automatically logs us in and we've been successful. I hope you found the demonstration informative. For AWS Training and Certification, I'm Mike Blackmer. Hi, I'm Ian Falconer with AWS Training and Certification. Welcome to this introductory course on AWS Lambda, AWS's event-driven serverless compute service. In this course, we're going to talk about AWS Lambda. We'll cover a brief introduction and the service benefits and dive a little deeper into some key features and concepts. I'll then discuss a few use cases and wrap things up with a quick summary. So what is AWS Lambda? AWS Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. AWS Lambda executes your code only when needed and scales automatically to thousands of requests per second. I want to take just a couple of minutes now to review the key benefits of this service. You only pay for the compute you use. You don't pay for compute time when your code is not running. This makes AWS Lambda ideal for variable and intermittent workloads. You can run code for virtually any application or back-end service, all with zero administration. AWS Lambda runs your code on highly available compute infrastructure, which provides all administration, including server and operating system maintenance, capacity provisioning and auto-scaling, code monitoring and logging. AWS Lambda supports a variety of programming languages, including Node.js, Java, c -sharp, and Python. How can we use AWS Lambda? We can use it for event-driven computing. You can run code in response to events, including changes to an S3 bucket or an Amazon DynamoDB table. You can respond to HTTP requests using Amazon API Gateway. You can invoke your code using API calls made using the AWS SDKs. You can build serverless applications that are triggered by AWS Lambda functions. And you can automatically deploy them using AWS Code Pipeline and AWS Code Deploy. AWS Lambda is intended to support serverless and microservices applications. To avoid creating monolithic and tightly coupled solutions, AWS Lambda imposes the following configuration options. Your disk space is limited to 512 megabytes. Memory allocation is available from 128 to 1536 megabytes. AWS Lambda function execution is limited to a maximum of five minutes. You are constrained by deployment package size and the maximum number of file descriptors. And your request and response body payload cannot exceed 6 megabytes. The event request body is also limited to 128 kilobytes. The number of concurrent executions is a soft limit which can be increased upon request. And AWS Lambda is built on the number of times your code is triggered and for each 100 millisecond of execution time. It's really simple to build your Lambda function. You configure your Lambda environment, then you upload your code and watch it run. It's as simple as that. So now let's do a quick demo. We're going to build an image recognition app. So I built a really quick little app in which we have a website hosted in Amazon S3. When you upload an image, it will trigger a Lambda function which will then process that image and generate a thumbnail. 
Creating a Lambda function is really easy. Here you can see I'm in the AWS console at the Create Function page for uh, AWS Lambda. You can see I already have a number of Lambda functions here, uh, and we're going to look at the Check S3 Public Access Lambda function. So we simply hit Create Function and name our Lambda function, and here's what that looks like. You can see I've got my Lambda function name up the top left, and I'm now configuring my Lambda function. I've chosen my runtime, in this case it's Python, I've named my handler, and I've added my Python code. In this case, this Python code, this Lambda function, is checking my S3 buckets, and if it sees any buckets with public access, uh, it then revokes that access and then sends me notification. While I'm configuring my Lambda function, I can configure environment variables if I want to apply encryption. Uh, I can apply tags. Uh, I can choose an execution role. In this case, I've chosen a role that gives my Lambda function the necessary permissions to operate. And I can configure my Lambda function's memory allocation, in this case 128 megabytes, and its execution timeout. I've left it at the maximum of five minutes. Next, I move on to configure my trigger. In this case, I'm using CloudWatch events to trigger my Lambda function. And you can see that, that I have one CloudWatch event. That event is enabled. And it's used to watch changes in an S3 bucket. And it triggers this particular Lambda function. I can now look at my monitoring page for my Lambda function. And you can see here under invocation count that this Lambda function has run four times. When this Lambda function runs, I'm sent a notification that, and you can see here for an S3 bucket called IFAL public, it had access to everyone. This Lambda function has revoked public access from this bucket, and it has also updated CloudTrail. With AWS Lambda, we can run code for virtually any application or backend service. AWS Lambda use cases include automated backups, processing objects uploaded to S3, event-driven log analysis, event-driven transformations, uh, Internet of Things, uh, operating serverless websites. Let's explore a real-time image processing use case. A customer uploads an image on S3, triggering a Lambda function to process that image immediately. You can use this to transcode videos, thumbnails, index files, process logs, validate your content, and aggregate data in real time. One of our customers, the Seattle Times, uses AWS Lambda to resize images for viewing on different devices, such as desktop computers, tablets, and smartphones. You can use AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis to process real-time streaming data for application activity tracking, transaction order processing, clickstream analysis, data cleansing metrics, a generation log filtering, indexing social media analysis, and device data telemetry and metering. We have customers processing billions of data points in real time using AWS Lambda to process historical and live data stored in S3 or streamed from Amazon Kinesis. They can process 100 billion events each single month. You can use AWS Lambda to build your extract, transform and load pipelines. You can also use AWS Lambda to perform data validation, filtering, sorting or other transformations for every data change in a DynamoDB table and load the transformed data to another data store. Zillow uses AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis to track a subset of mobile metrics in real time. They are able to develop and deploy a cost-effective solution in just two weeks. You can also use AWS Lambda to build your backends for your IoT devices. You can combine API Gateway with AWS Lambda to easily build your mobile backend. API Gateway makes it really easy for you to authenticate and process those API requests, and AWS Lambda makes it really easy for you to build and develop those rich, personalized app experiences. Most of our customers use a microservices backend using AWS Lambda, SNS, and API Gateway to run both their website and their mobile applications. You can also use AWS Lambda to build your web backends by combining AWS Lambda and other AWS services. Developers can build powerful web applications that automatically scale up and down. Those applications run in a highly available configuration across multiple data centers with zero administrative effort required for scalability, backups, and multi-data center redundancy. So in summary, we like to think of AWS Lambda as the connective tissue for AWS services, from building microservices architectures to running your applications. 
I hope you learned a little something today and will continue to explore other courses. I'm Ian Falconer with the AWS Training and Certification Team. Thanks for watching. Welcome to this introduction to AWS Alaska Beanstalk. My name is Wilson Santana and I am an EMEA Technical Trainer for Amazon Web Services. In this video, we are going to have a quick introduction to the AWS Alaska Beanstalk service. We are also going to be discussing the components of the solution and we are going to have a demonstration of the product and its benefits and features. Let's think that you are a developer of a web service. You may not be actually worried about developing the, the servers, developing the whole administration of your system, and actually administering everything behind the actual development of your service. So, you are probably wondering, how can I quickly get my application into the cloud? How can I quickly have the whole environment ready so I can start developing my system? The answer to that is AWS Elastic Beanstalk. But how AWS Elastic Beanstalk actually works? Which are the benefits and features of the system? It's a platform as a service. And being a platform as a service, it means that you have the whole infrastructure and the whole platform created to you so you can simply put your code over the system as required. Also, it allows a quick deployment of your applications. Any code that you have previously written on some specific languages can be simply placed over the platform that you have. Also, it reduces the management complexity. You don't need to worry about managing the whole system. But if you wish, you can have full control over that. The control over the system that has been developed to you allows you to choose your instance type or according to your needs, choose the database that's better to your needs. Also, it allows you to set and adjust auto scaling according to your needs. Besides, it allows you to update your application, access server log files, and enables HTTPS on load balancer according to the needs of your application. It also supports a large range of platforms. It goes from Packer Builder to single container, multi container, or pre configured Docker. It supports Go, Java, with Tomcat or SE, .NET on Windows. Node.js, PHP, Python, Ruby. So depending on your skills, on the idea of developing your web service, you can simply write your code and use Beanstalk to deploy your environment as you need. Elastic Beanstalk is going to provide you all the application service level, the HTTP service, operational system, language interpret, and the host. The only need that you have then is create your code deploy it, prepare it according to the needs of your service, and then you're simply going to use the application as you need. With that, you're going to have something really easily implemented. Also, the steps to deploy and update your service are based only on the creation of your application. After that, you upload the version to be installed that then launches all needed environment in the cloud according to the needs of your application. After that, you can manage your environment, and if you need to write a new version, you just update the version. And deploying that, you can manage that. With this cycle, it becomes really easy to update your application as easily as you deploy it. Let's go now for the product demonstration, where the features and benefits from Elastic Beanstalk are going to be then demonstrated. Let's consider a real case scenario where you have created your web service and uh, you have written this service, for example, in Python. And uh, all your code is here. It's a real simple code where you have your application properly zipped. What you need to do now? How can I actually have the environment and make it available worldwide to have my web service properly presented to everyone around the world. When we've been installed, this is something extremely straightforward. 
the only thing that we need to do is actually start the service. Then we go to our dashboard and look for Elastic Beanstalk. There, what we need to do is create a new application. We just enter then our application name. In our case, let's enter the name Beanstalk Demo. And a simple description. This is a demo. The only thing that you need to know right now is create the environment for the application. What do I need to do now? Create one now. This is a web server environment. If I need to run a work application processing long running workloads on demand or tasks in schedule, I could move to work and environment. But in this situation, the only thing that I have created is a simple web server environment. I go here and select web server environment. And I enter then some extra data according to my needs. I'm going to enter here any domain that I would like to create manually, but I can leave it blank for auto-generated value. That's what we're going to do. A description. This is a demo. And here we have some options. We have some pre-configured platforms with the language that we have already mentioned as support. In this case, we are going to select Python because my application has been written in Python. We also have the options here of running a sample application. So if you want to use your account right now, even without an application, to play with Beanstalk, it's quite straightforward. Just open Beanstalk and run a sample application. In this case, we have a code that has been written in Python. So I'm going to upload your code and then I'm going to upload that. I'm just going to choose the file from that's a local file that I have. But if I have this file available in a URL, I can simply select a public S3 URL here. Choose the file. Here is my file in zip format. And I then upload the file. If I want to modify any default configurations, I can simply go to Configure More Options. In this area here, I am allowed to choose between the low cost, which are the free tier defaults, or I can go for high availability or custom configuration. In our example, we are going to keep all of this at the defaults, but in this example here, you can see how flexible it can be after you create your defaults. Let's just create our environment. What the system is doing right now is creating the whole environment, all the instances which are required, all the networking environment. If your application requires a database, if your application requires something extra to be deployed in high availability, all the steps are going to be then performed and displayed here in this log. This is something that can take about five to 10 minutes, depending on the size of your application, sometimes even more. To speed up that, I have already created an environment with the exact same code that you can use. And this is what you're going to see when everything is ready. When everything is ready, you're going to have a dashboard like this showing what you have created and allowing you to upload and deploy new versions. But most important, you're going to have this URL. This URL is the URL that has been created to your application, so anyone can access that anywhere. Clicking on that, you're going to see that your code has been deployed and has been created according to your needs. Besides that, all this control here can also be performed using command line interface and scripts. With that, it's clear that the environment that has been created is supplying my needs according to the code. And you don't need to actually worry about the architecture of the system beforehand. So it makes it really easy for, for your developer to go create the code and make it available in a real scenario.
I hope you have learned something from this presentation. This is Wilson Santana. Thanks for watching. Hi. Welcome to our introduction to the application load balancer. In this video, we will introduce the second type of load balancer under the Elastic Load Balancing Service, which is the application load balancer. My name is Seth, and I've been with AWS for over five years. I'm currently working as a technical trainer responsible for delivering trainings to customers using Amazon Web Services. Our agenda for this video is to first overview the application load balancer and introduce to you some of the major features included in this service. After that, we will discuss some of the usage scenarios where you could use the application load balancer. Lastly, we will go through a short demonstration of the load balancer itself. Starting off, what is the load balancer? The application load balancer is, as stated earlier, the second type of load balancer introduced as part of the Elastic Load Balancing Service. While it still offers most of the features provided by the classic load balancer, it adds some important features and enhancements that lend it to unique use cases. At a quick look, some of the newly enhanced features include additional supported request protocols, enhanced metrics and access logs, and more target health checks. Some of the additional features for the application load balancer are the ability to enable additional routing mechanisms for your request using path or host-based routing, native IPv6 support in a VPC, AWS web application firewall integration, and more. There is a vast number of scenarios in which you would use the application load balancer. One is the ability to use containers to host your microservices and route to those applications from a single load balancer. Application load balancer allows you to route different requests to the same instance but differ the path based on the port. If you have different containers listening on various ports, you can set up routing rules to distribute traffic to only the desired backend application. There are some new terms to learn when looking at the application load balancer. While listeners are essentially the same, you can now group the destinations or targets into target groups. Because the application load balancer registers targets instead of instances, a target group is how the targets are registered to the load balancer. Here, we can see how the application load balancer routes and organizes backend targets. When configuring the listeners for the load balancer, you create rules in order to direct how the requests received by the load balancer will be routed to the backend targets. To register those targets to the load balancer and configure the health check the load balancer will use for the targets, you create target groups. As we see here, targets can also be members of multiple target groups. As stated earlier, the application load balancer includes both enhanced and added features. The application load balancer has enhanced the supported protocols by adding HTTP2 and WebSocket support. Additionally, monitoring capabilities have been increased by adding metric dimensions, performing more granular health checks, and additional details in the access logs. Some of the added features now supported are path and host-based routing. Path-based routing allows you to create rules to route to target groups based on the URL in the request. Host-based routing enables the ability to have multiple domains supported by the same load balancer and route requests to target groups based on the domain requested. In addition to that, you gain the ability to use request tracing to track requests from clients to targets and the ability to enable dynamic host ports when using EC2 container services scheduled containers. So now we'll look at a quick demonstration of the application load balancer. We'll start in the AWS Management Console and to create a load balancer we will go to the EC2 console. So once in the EC2 console you'll see that I already have two instances running. I launched these instances so that we would not have to wait for them to start while we were going through this demo. To test and see what I have set up, let's look at the application ELB test instance that I have created. 
when looking at this instance, we will show that I have two containers listening on two different ports. So to do that, we will copy the public IP address for the instance, and then in a web browser tab, we will go to the pages that I have set up for the demonstration. The first page is just listening on port 80, and it is test.html. If we go to that site, we'll see that container 1 is working. If we want to see the other port that I have listening, we'll go to port 443 and go to the same page location. And then that will show that we have the second container up and running. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and create our application load balancer. To do that, in the side navigation pane, we will go to load balancers. You will currently see that I have no load balancers created. So to create an application load balancer, first I will click create load balancer, and then I will let the default selection remain, which is application load balancer. After that, I will click continue, and this is where I start to configure the load balancer. So first, we will name our load balancer. Keep in mind that the name that we put here will go into the DNS endpoint for this load balancer. So I will name this ALB for application load balancer and test. This will be an internet facing load balancer, meaning that it will have a publicly referenceable DNS endpoint. And I will leave the address type as default, which is IPv4. For the listeners on the load balancer, the default setting already has it listening for port 80, but so that I can route to the second container from the same load balancer, I will add an additional listener, uh, and that will just be a simple HTTP request to port 443. After that, the load balancer wants us to select the availability zones that we will be running in. With the application load balancer, it requires you to select at least two availability zones. So I will select the VPC that I have created for this demonstration, and then select the two availability zones that I have created subnets into. After that, we have the option to tag our load balancer. To tag the load balancer, uh, you simply just state the key and value for which you would reference this load balancer. Uh, for the one that we're building here, I will set the key to name, and then I will set the value to application load balancer. After that, we can configure the security settings. On this page, we would configure the security settings if we were using an SSL listener. Since we are not, we will go ahead and go to the next page where we configure the security group. For the load balancer, I am going to deselect the default security group and select the test web server security group that I have set up for this load balancer. After that, we can move forward and configure the routing. This is going to allow you to configure a routing rule for the back-end destination for your load balancer. So to do this, uh, because I have not pre-created any target groups, I will go ahead and keep the new target group set, and then I will name the target group. This target group will be named Demo1. The protocol that it's using is HTTP, and the port is going to be to 80. For the health check, it's going to stay an HTTP request, and the health check destination is going to be the simple web page that we have set up, which is test.html. We can also go into advanced health check settings, and this is where we can adjust how we want the health check to be done. In order to make sure that our target is healthy at an earlier time, I'm going to lower the health check interval to every 10 seconds, but I'm going to keep the timeout and the healthy and unhealthy thresholds the same. After that, we start to register our targets. Registering the target is telling the load balancer what instance you want that port to be hit. So I have the instances set up here, and I will go ahead and select the application ELB test instance 
that has been set up. After I select that instance, I click Add to Registered, and you will see that the instance is listed as one of the registered targets. Moving forward, we get to our review page. On the review page, we see everything that we have configured. It's showing the load balancer's name. It's showing the listeners and the routing rules that we have set up. And it is showing the new target group that we have set up with Demo1. After that, we can go ahead and click Create. We see that our load balancer has successfully been created, so we'll close the screen and it will take us to the load balancer dashboard. Because we have two targets that we want to check with this load balancer, in order to register the second target, we must first create a target group. So, to do this, under target group, we will select create target group, and this new target group is going to go to the second container that we have set up. So the target group name for this will be Demo2. And it's going to be an HTTP request, but it's going to be forwarding requests to port 443. It's going to be in the same VPC. And our health check is going to be the same target, but in the separate container. So it's going to be test.html. Under the advanced health check settings, we again have the options to adjust our health check and again I will lower the interval to every 10 seconds. After that I can create the target group and it shows that I have successfully created my second target group. With that second target group I then have to make sure that I have registered the instance as a target for that target group. Because it's done I can now go over to my load balancer and verify that I have both ports set up for the listening on the load balancer, but because I set up 443 when I was creating the load balancer, it is currently forwarding it to demo1. In order to change that, I will click view and edit rules, and under the then Instead of forwarding it to demo1, I will edit and edit this rule that I have created and forward it to demo2. Once I've done that, I click update and the rule to route traffic hitting port 443 on the load balancer is now forwarding to the target group demo2. I can now go back and view the load balancer. Now that we have created our second target group and registered it to the load balancer, we can test to verify that our traffic is being sent to each container. To do that, we will again copy the DNS name. And then in a new tab, for the first container, we will paste the DNS name and we will go to the target that we have set up for the demonstration, which is test.html. And we can see that container one is available. To test the second container, we have the load balancer listening on port 443, so we will set it to go to port 443, which should forward traffic to 443 on the instance where container 2 is listening. If we hit enter, we can see that container 2 is now up and running. If we would like to adjust the listening, for the load balancer, we can always go to the listeners tab and add or edit the listeners that we have running. In review, this demonstration covered launching an application load balancers, configuring the routing rules, registering the targets to the load balancer, and then verifying the operation of the application load balancers routing. I hope you learned a little something and will continue to explore other videos. I'm Seth with AWS Training and Certification. Thanks for watching. Hi, welcome to Introduction to the Amazon Elastic Load Balancer. In this video, we will introduce the Elastic Load Balancer's original type, the Classic Load Balancer. My name is Seth, and I'm a technical trainer with Amazon Web Services. I've been with AWS for over five years. This video will be covering the Classic Load Balancer. We'll start with a quick service introduction and overview some of the major features of the service. 
After that, we'll go into a short demonstration showing the launching of the load balancer. The classic load balancer is a distributed software load balancing service that enables the use of many helpful features packaged into a managed solution. Various use cases of which you could choose the Elastic Load Balancer would be the ability to secure access to your web servers through a single exposed point of access, decoupling your application environment using both public facing and internal load balancers, providing high availability and fault tolerance with the ability to distribute traffic across multiple availability zones, and increase elasticity and scalability with minimal overhead. As far as traffic distribution is concerned, the ability for the Elastic Load Balancer to distribute traffic depends on what type of request you are distributing. If you are distributing HTTP or HTTPS requests, then the Elastic Load Balancer uses a simple round robin for these requests. If you are processing TCP requests, then the Elastic Load Balancer will use a least outstanding request for the backend instances. The Elastic Load Balancer also helps with distributing traffic across multiple availability zones. If you create the Load Balancer within the Management Console, this feature is enabled by default. But if you launch the Elastic Load Balancer through the command line tools or an SDK, then this will need to be enabled as a secondary process. As stated earlier, the Elastic Load Balancer provides a single exposed point of access for accessing your backend instances. The easiest way to do this would be to set up an alias record to point your domain's CNAME to the endpoint for your Elastic Load Balancer. If you would like to use cookies for your application, then the Elastic Load Balancer provides the feature of sticky sessions. This will allow you to bind a user session for the duration of that session, and it's set depending on if you want to use duration-based cookies or application-controlled sticky sessions. As far as monitoring is concerned, the Elastic Load Balancer provides many metrics by default. These metrics allow you to see HTTP responses, the number of healthy and unhealthy hosts behind the Load Balancer, and you can filter these metrics based on the availability zone of the backend instances or based on the load balancer that you are using. For health checks, the load balancer allows you to see the number of healthy and unhealthy ECT hosts behind your load balancer. This is done with a simple attempted connection or ping request to the backend EC2 instance. The load balancer helps you with your scalability by providing you with your multi-zone load balancing, which enables you to distribute traffic across multiple availability zones within your VPC. Additionally, the load balancer itself will scale based on the traffic pattern that it sees. With the classic load balancer, you have the ability to create different types of load balancers. One type would be an internet-facing or public-facing load balancer. This gives you a publicly resolvable DNS name that still allows your cross-zone balancing and allows you to route requests to the backend instances from your single exposed endpoint of your load balancer. The other type of load balancer is the internal load balancer. The internal load balancer has a DNS name that resolves only to private nodes, so it can only be accessed through the VPC. This provides a decoupling of your infrastructure within your VPC and allows for the scalability of both the front end and the back end instances while the load balancer handles its own scaling. So now we'll dive into a short demonstration of the classic load balancer. So in this demonstration, we'll cover launching a load balancer and attaching an instance to that load balancer, and then we'll verify that the traffic is being routed to the backend instance. I have already launched an EC2 instance for this demonstration. The EC2 instance is sitting in a VPC with an internet gateway attached, and it is sitting in a public subnet. So if we would like to verify 
that the simple web application is running on the EC2 instance, we can simply take the public IP address for the instance and then launch that into a new tab. As we can see, it is showing the public IP address for the instance and it is showing this instance's ID and its availability zone. In order to put this instance behind a load balancer, in the navigation pane within the EC2 console, simply scroll down to load balancing. Here you can click on load balancers and it will take you to the load balancing console. Once you are in the load balancing console, you will click create load balancer and for this demonstration we will be using the classic load balancer. So we will select that and click continue. After that we will name our load balancer. Keep in mind that the name that you give your load balancer will go into the DNS named endpoint for the load balancer. So our load balancer for this demonstration will be named CLB for classic load balancer and then test because this is a test load balancer. The create ELB inside is the environment in which you would like to create your load balancer. So if you are using EC2 Classic, then you can create your load balancer in EC2 Classic. For this demonstration, we will be using the Classic ELB Test VPC that I have already created. For configuring the listeners, you first select where you would like the load balancer to receive traffic, and then the instance port that you would like the load balancers to forward the traffic to. So here I have the load balancer listening on port 80 and it, it is also forwarding traffic to port 80 on the backend instances. After that you will select the subnet that you would like your ELB to operate in within your VPC. So for this purpose I have created private subnet 1. I will add that to the load balancer and then next I will assign the security group for the load balancer. The security group that I am going to use for the load balancer and it is an existing security group that I have already created. So for this load balancer I will use the public classic load balancing test security group. So this is for a public facing ELB. After that I will configure the security settings which I will not be using since we are not using SSL for this load balancer. Continuing on, we will configure the health check. The health check will be where the load balancer is sending a request to verify if the instance is up or if the instance needs to be sidelined. What I'm going to do for my health check is going to be a simple ping request and my target is actually going to be index.php instead of index.html. The interval is going to be how often the health check is being sent and the response timeout is how long the load balancer will wait before considering it a failed health check. For this test I am going to shorten the interval to every 10 seconds. The unhealthy threshold is how many consecutive failed health check requests before the load balancer considers the instance as unhealthy and then the healthy threshold is how many successful consecutive tests before the load balancer considers a previously unhealthy instance as healthy. After that, we will add the AC2 instance that I have pre-created to the load balancer. So for this, because I only have the one instance currently running, I will select that instance and it will connect it to the load balancer. For the add tag step, this is going to be if you want to tag your load balancer 
for easy classification. So I will go ahead and tag the load balancer with the key being name and the value for that being CLB test. After that, we will click review and create where it will allow us to review all of the settings that we created for this load balancer. And once we have verified that those are where we want them, we can click create. Once you see the successfully created load balancer screen, you can close this and it will take you to the load balancing console. In the load balancing console, you can view various details about your load balancer. Under the descriptions tag, you can see the basic details for your load balancer, seeing that you have the load balancer's DNS endpoint, the subnet and availability zone for your load balancer, and the type of load balancer that you have created. For this demonstration, we created an internet-facing load balancer. To see which instances are connected to your load balancer, you simply click the Instances tab. Once you see that, you can see all of the instances that are currently connected to your load balancer, and you could connect or remove instances manually with your load balancer. Currently, we see that the instance is out of service. This is because the instance has not passed the correct number of health checks for it to be seen as healthy. If we hover over the information tab here, we can see that the instance registration is still in progress. Moving forward, we can see the health check details and we can see the listeners that we have set up for our load balancer. All of this can be edited live with the load balancer. And then if we would like to view some of the monitoring metrics for the load balancer, we can go to the monitoring tab. Because the load balancer has not been running for very long, we will not see any metrics. Keep in mind that the default metric interval for CloudWatch is five minutes. So if we go back to the Instance tab, we now see that our instance is in service. So we can take the DNS name for our load balancer, and then we can paste that into a new tab. And we can see that our instance details are still showing. It's just that now we went to the instance through the load balancer instead of to the instance directly. In this demonstration, we covered launching the classic load balancer, then we configured listeners and health checks for your load balancer, and then after that, we registered an instance to the load balancer and verified the operation of the classic load balancer. I hope you learned a little something and will continue to explore other videos. I'm Seth with AWS Training and Certification. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Andy Cummings with AWS Training and Certification. Welcome to an introduction to auto scaling. I've been with AWS for going on a year and a half now and I'm currently responsible for delivering live training events to AWS customers across North America. In this video, we will introduce auto scaling. We're going to go through an overview and potential use cases of the service and then walk through a demonstration so you can see the service in action. So what is auto scaling? Auto scaling helps you ensure that you have the correct number of EC2 instances available to handle the load for your application. Using auto scaling removes the guesswork of how many EC2 instances you need at a point in time to meet your workload requirements. When you run your applications on EC2 instances, it is critical to monitor the performance of your workload using CloudWatch. CloudWatch by itself, however, will not add or remove EC2 instances. This is where auto scaling comes into the picture. Let's look at an example workload. We've used CloudWatch to measure EC2 resource requirements over a standard week. 
Note that the resource requirements vary with Wednesday requiring the most capacity and Saturday the least. We could go the route of allocating more than enough EC2 capacity to always be able to meet our highest demand time, in this case Wednesday. However, this means that we are running resources that will be underutilized most days of the week. This is an option, but our costs are not optimized. On the other end of the scale, we could allocate fewer EC2 instances, thus reducing cost. This means that we are under capacity on certain days, and if we don't solve our capacity problem, our application could underperform or potentially even time out for the user. Obviously, this is not a good thing. Auto scaling allows you to add or remove EC2 instances based on conditions that you specify. Auto scaling is especially powerful in environments with fluctuating performance requirements. This allows you to maintain performance and minimize cost. So auto scaling really answers two critical questions. One, how can I ensure that my workload has enough EC2 resources to meet fluctuating performance requirements? And two, how can I automate EC2 resource provisioning to occur on demand? Auto scaling matches up with two critical AWS best practices. Make your environment scalable and automate as much as possible. Let's take a closer look at the service. So what exactly do we mean by scaling? The first thing we have to do is to find the concepts of scaling out and scaling in. Auto scaling can automatically adjust the number of EC2 instances running in your workload based on either conditions that you define, CP utilization over 80% as an example, or a schedule. If auto scaling adds more instances, this is termed scaling out. When auto scaling terminates instances, this is scaling in. Remember that you have control as to what initiates these events. So how do you auto scale? There are three components required for auto scaling. First, you create a launch configuration. Second, you create an auto scaling group. And finally, you define at least one auto scaling policy. Let's take a closer look at what each of these components do. What is a launch configuration? Well, this is all about defining what will be launched by auto scaling. Think of all the things that you would specify when you launch an EC2 instance from the console, such as which Amazon machine image to use, what instance type, security groups, or roles to apply to the instance. What is an auto scaling group? This is about defining where a deployment takes place and some boundaries for the deployment. This is where you define which VPC to deploy instances and which load balancer to interact with. You also specify the boundaries for a group. If you set a minimum of two, if your server count goes below two, another instance will be launched to replace it. If you set the maximum to eight, you will never have more than eight instances in your group. The desired capacity is the number that you wish to start with. What is an auto-scaling policy? This is about specifying when to launch or terminate EC2 instances. You can schedule auto-scaling every Thursday at 3 p.m. as an example, or create conditions that define thresholds to trigger adding or removing instances. Condition-based policies make your auto-scaling dynamic and able to meet fluctuating requirements. It is best practice to create at least one auto-scaling policy to specify when to scale out and at least one policy to specify when to scale in. How does dynamic auto-scaling work? One common configuration is to create CloudWatch alarms based on performance information from your EC2 instances or a load balancer. When a performance threshold is breached, a CloudWatch alarm triggers an auto-scaling event, which will either scale out or scale in EC2 instances in the environment. Let's take a look at a sample CloudWatch alarm. The first part of the alarm is a condition with a specific threshold. In this case, CPU utilization is greater than 80%. Note there is also a time period specified that you can control. This means we could be specifying that the alarm will fire if CPU utilization is over 80% for five consecutive minutes. The time period is critical because you don't want auto scaling to trigger new instances because your processor spiked for 30 seconds. The second part of the alarm is the action to perform after the alarm is triggered. With auto scaling, the action could be to add or remove instances. So in our case here, if the CPU is over 80% for one consecutive period, five minutes by default, Auto scaling will add two new instances to the auto scaling group. As we add more instances, the CPU utilization should go down. We should set another CloudWatch alarm to define a threshold as to when instances should be terminated from the auto scaling group. As an example, if CPU utilization goes below 20% for more than five consecutive minutes, terminate one instance. The beauty of all this is that auto scaling can manage your workload dynamically so you can focus on other issues. Okay, let's do a brief demo with auto scaling so you can see this for yourself. We're going to create a basic launch configuration, an auto scaling group, and an auto scaling policy. Then we'll finish up by triggering auto scaling so we can see it work. 
So the first thing we're going to do is open up the EC2 service. Remember the three components we need to build out, a launch configuration, an auto-scaling group, and one or more auto-scaling policies. On the left-hand pane, we're going to scroll down to the auto-scaling section and choose auto-scaling groups. We'll click on create auto-scaling group, then we'll select to create a launch configuration. If you've launched an EC2 instance before, you will recognize the choices we need to make. We're going to choose an Amazon AMI, and then we'll go ahead and choose an M4 large instance type. All right, now we'll give our launch configuration a name. We'll say Linux M4. We'll leave the default settings for storage and security groups. And we'll review our configuration and click launch, create launch configuration. Now we're going to choose an existing key pair that's already out there and create the launch configuration. All right, this takes us directly into the properties for the auto scaling group. We'll give it a name. We'll say sales app. You can see that it's using the launch configuration that we just built out. We're going to specify to start with two instances. And then we're going to specify which VPC and subnet to actually go to deploy the instances into. Then we're going to configure to configure scaling policies. All right, we're going to choose to use scaling policies to adjust the capacity of this group. And we're going to set the scaling between two and eight instances. This is going to be our minimum and maximum values here. We'll also use a simple target tracking policy that allows us to set a target value for a metric. We're going to go and say average CPU utilization of 60% here. A target tracking policy is then automatically launches or terminates instances to meet your target value. We can still create individual policies for scaling in and out, but target tracking is the simplest way to get started with auto scaling policies. We'll view where we can add notifications and tags. And then review and select to create the auto scaling group. Okay, so now let's go ahead and view our auto scaling group. Move this up a little tighter so we can see everything along the way. You can see that the maximum instance, the minimum instances is set for two, and the maximum is set for eight. And if we go to the instances tab, we can see that there are two instances that are currently pending. These are brand new instances, and the reason those exist, this didn't exist before. Remember, we set the minimum value as to two, so auto scaling automatically launched two instances inside of here. Now, to trigger auto scaling immediately, we're going to manually increase the minimum group size. We'll click on the details tab, choose to edit the details, and we're going to change the minimum number of instances and the desired configuration, so we're going to go up to four. All right, so now our minimum instances, minimum number of instances should be four rather than two. So seeing as how we have two already, we should be seeing two more instances that are being launched. Let's go back to the Instances tab, take a look inside. And as you can see, we now have two more instances that have been fired off automatically based on our launch configuration. Okay, so let's summarize what we've learned. Auto scaling allows you to add or remove EC2 instances based on conditions that you specify. Auto scaling is especially powerful in environments with fluctuating performance requirements. This allows you to maintain performance and minimize cost. Best of all, this process can scale in or scale out EC2 instances in the middle of the night while you are sleeping. The three core components we need are a launch configuration, the what to deploy, an auto scaling group, the where to deploy, and an auto scaling policy, which is the when to deploy. Remember that every AWS service that you learn about is another tool to build solutions. The more tools you can bring to the table, the more powerful. Welcome to Amazon Elastic Block Store introductory video. 
I'm Rafael Lopez with the AWS Training and Certification Team. And as part of the team, I have contributed to develop and deliver exclusive training content like this one. In this brief video, I will be introducing the Amazon EBS service with an overview and a demonstration. So let's get started. EBS volumes can be used as the storage unit for your EC2 instances. So whenever you think you need a disk space for your instances running on AWS, you can think about them. These volumes can be hard disks or SSD devices and you pay as you use. So whenever you don't need a volume anymore, you can just delete it and stop paying for it. EBS volumes are designed for being durable and available. This means that the data in a volume is automatically replicated across multiple servers running in the availability zone. I made the comparison about EBS volumes and physical media devices like hard disks or SSDs, but it's actually much more durable than that because of the block level replication. When creating an EBS volume, you can select the type for storage that best fit your needs. You can choose between magnetic or SSD based on your performance and price requirements. It's all about choosing the right tool for the right job. So, for example, if you are running a database instance, you can configure the database to use a secondary volume for the data, which may perform faster than the volume assigned to the operating system. Or you can assign a magnetic volume for the logs because magnetic is cheaper. To provide an even higher level of data durability, Amazon EBS gives you the ability to create point-in-time snapshots of your volumes. And AWS allows you to recreate a new volume from a snapshot at any time, share snapshots, or even copy snapshots to a different AWS region for even greater disaster recovery protection. You can, for example, encrypt and share your snapshots from Virginia to Tokyo. You can also have encrypted EBS volumes at no additional cost. The encryption occurs on the EC2 side, so the data moving between the EC2 instance and the EBS volume inside AWS data centers will be encrypted in transit. As your company grows, the amount of data stored on your EBS volumes will likely also grow. EBS volumes has the ability to increase capacity and change to different types, meaning that you can change from hard disk to SSD, or increasing a 50 gigabytes volume to a 16 terabyte volume, for example. You can do these resize operations on the fly without needing to stop the instances. So let me do a demonstration to show you how fast and easy it is to create a new volume and attach that volume into an EC2 instance. Inside our AWS Management Console, the EC2 instances and the EBS volumes can be located here on the EC2 console, which you can find by clicking here in EC2 under the Compute tab. If we click here in Instances, we can see that I have many instances running and the volumes are located here on the sidebar in Volumes under Elastic Block Store or EBS Volumes. So these are the volumes that I have in my account. If I want to create a new volume and attach that new volume into an instance, in this case I will attach into the Linux instance, the EBS volume must be created on the same availability zone where the instance resides. So if this instance is in US East 1B, when I create the volume, I also need to create the volume in US East 1B. So let's do that. Here in Volumes, Create Volume, and here the first thing that I specify is the availability zone US East 1B because I will want to attach this EBS volume into an instance that is running in US East 1B. Here I have the option to specify the volume type, such as magnetic or SSD. The general purpose SSD will, build, will charge me only for the amount of the size in gigabytes. If I want to create a volume that has 25 gigabytes, I just specify the 25 gigabytes here. This is how I can restore a snapshot to a volume, which in the case I'm, I don't want to do that. And then I click in Create Volume. This is the volume ID that is being created for me. If I click in Close, I can have the option of sorting these volumes by created date, volume type, size, and we can see that this is the volume that I just created. 25 gigabytes of the volume type GP2, which is SSD. Now that the volume is created, we want to attach that volume into an EC2 instance. So I just click here in Actions, Attach Volume, and then I specify the instance that I want to attach the volume, which in this case is Linux instance, and the device. So let's say slash dev slash STB. Attach. Now, if we log inside that instance, which we can do by clicking here in Instances, selecting the Linux instance, clicking here in Connect, and copying the SSH command, because this is a Linux instance, 
and I'm using a Mac OS, I can go back here to my terminal and do the SSH command. So I copy the SSH command and I paste in my terminal. Now I am connected inside my EC2 instances. If I do the command lsblk, I can see what are the block storage devices that I have attached on this instance. And we can clearly see here on slash dev slash xvdb, which is kind of the same for sdb, as a 25 gigabytes disk. Now with this EBS volume attached, we can create a file system of it with it. So we can do this command slash dev slash xvdb. This got to run as root. And then my Linux operating system is now creating a file system on this volume. If I do lsblk again, nothing changed here, but now I am able to mount that volume into a folder in my Linux machine. If this was a Windows machine, I would need to go on disk management and then I could create the file system and mount from there. To mount on a Linux machine, we do the common mount, the mount point, xvdb, and the folder that we want to mount that volume. Only root can do that, so let's do it with root permissions. And now that volume is mounted on the slash mnt folder. If we go to the slash mnt folder, we have our file system. So we can create our files, our directories, our symbolic links, and everything that a storage block device gives the ability to us on doing. This is a text file. If I do an ls, now I can see my files there. I can create a directory. I can move files to that directory. If I do an ls, I have a folder. If I enter in that folder, my file is inside that folder. So you can see how easy it is to create, attach, and format an EBS volume to an EC2 instance. At any time, I can go back here and with the command amount, I can amount the volume to the folder. And then I am able to go back to the AWS Management Console, clicking volumes, select my volume, and detach this volume from my instance. If the volume is detached, it will stay in the available state. You can see that this volume is now in use because it's actually being used with, for my, with my instance. Since this volume is available, I can detach that and attach to another EC2 instance on the same availability zone, which in this case is US East 1B. I can also put tags in this volume. So if this volume is being used by a database, I can put the tag value database volume. And that's it. Now this volume is the database volume. Tags are very important because whenever you put tags on your AWS resources, you can drill down your billing per tags. So you can see how much all of the volumes with the tag key name and the tag value database volume cost in a certain period of time. And the same with EC2 instances, EBS snapshots, and everything that supports tags. And that's it. In summary, we reviewed what are EBS volumes, and you saw a demo on how to create and attach one EBS volume to a Linux EC2 instance. I hope you learned a little something and will continue to explore other videos. I'm Rafael Lopez with the AWS Training and Certification Team. Thanks for watching. Welcome to this video about Amazon Simple Storage Service, also known as Amazon S3. My name is Haywood Osman, and I'm a technical trainer with AWS. I will introduce you to Amazon S3, cover common usage scenarios, and then we'll get to see a quick demo of S3 in action. Let's begin. Amazon S3 is a fully managed storage service that provides a simple API for storing and retrieving data. This means that the data you store in S3 isn't associated with any particular server, and you don't have to manage any infrastructure yourself. You can put as many objects into S3 as you want. S3 holds trillions of objects and regularly peaks at millions of requests per second. Objects can be almost any data files, such as images, videos, or server logs. Since S3 supports objects as large as several terabytes in size, you could even store database snapshots as objects. Amazon S3 also provides low latency access to the data over the internet via HTTP or HTTPS, so you can retrieve data anytime from anywhere. 
You can also access S3 privately through a virtual private cloud endpoint. You get fine-grained control over who can access your data using identity and access management policies, S3 bucket policies, and even per-object access control lists. By default, none of your data is shared publicly. You can also encrypt your data in transit and choose to enable server-side encryption on your objects. Let's take a file we want to store, such as this welcome video. First, we need a place to put it. In S3, you can create a bucket to hold your data. When we want to put this video into our bucket as an object, we need to specify a key, which is just a string that can be used to retrieve the object later. A common practice is to set these strings in a way that resembles a file path. Let's put our video into S3 as an object with the corresponding key. When you create a bucket in S3, it's associated with a particular AWS region. Whenever you store data in the bucket, it is redundantly stored across multiple AWS facilities within your selected region. The S3 service is designed to durably store your data, even in the case of concurrent data loss in two AWS facilities. S3 will automatically manage the storage behind your bucket, even as your data grows. This allows you to get started immediately and to have your data storage grow with your application needs. S3 will also scale to handle high volume of requests. You don't have to provision the storage or throughput, and you'll only be billed for what you use. You can access S3 via the Management Console, AWS CLI, or AWS SDK. Additionally, you can also access the data in your bucket directly via the REST endpoints. These support HTTP or HTTPS access. Here we see an example of a URL for an object constructed from the bucket name, S3 endpoint for the selected region, and the key we use when we store the object. To support this type of URL-based access, S3 bucket names must be globally unique and DNS compliant. Also, object keys should be using characters that are safe for URLs. This flexibility to store a virtually unlimited amount of data and access that data from anywhere makes the S3 service suitable for a wide range of scenarios. Let's look at some use cases for S3. As a location for any application data, S3 buckets provide that shared location for storing objects any instances of your application can access, including applications on EC2 or even traditional servers. This can be useful for user-generated media files, server logs, or other files your application needs to store in a common location. Also, because the content can be fetched directly over the web, you can offload serving of that content from your application and allow clients to directly fetch the data themselves from S3. For static web hosting, S3 buckets can serve up the static contents of your website, including HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and other files. The high durability of S3 makes it a good candidate to store backups of your data. For even greater availability and disaster recovery capability, S3 can even be configured to support cross-region replication, such that data put into an S3 bucket in one region can be automatically replicated to another S3 region. The scalable storage and performance of S3 make it a great candidate for staging or long-term storage of data you plan to analyze using a variety of big data tools. For example, data staged in S3 can be loaded into Redshift, processed in EMR, or even queried in place using tools such as Amazon Athena. You can also import or export large volumes of data into S3 using AWS import-export devices such as Snowball. Given how simple it is to store and access data with S3, you'll find yourself using it frequently with AWS services and for other parts of your application. Now that we've covered S3 functionality and common use cases, you should be well on your way to identifying how S3 can help you as you build your application on AWS. Let's switch gears to a demo of S3 in action. Here we are in the Amazon S3 section of the AWS Management Console, and I can see that I have a listing of different buckets. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to go ahead and create a new bucket and then add some data to it and retrieve that data. Let's go ahead and click Create Bucket. Here I get prompted to set a bucket name and region. So the bucket name needs to be DNS compliant. I'll go ahead and set a name of Amazing Bucket 1 and then my next decision is on the region. In my case I know that I have an application running on EC2 instances that needs to access this data and that EC2 set of instances is in the Oregon region. So I'll go ahead and set my region to be US West Oregon. And at this point, I've made all the decisions that I need to make in order to create a bucket. 
The other steps in this wizard let me do things like turn versioning on my bucket or change the default permissions so that I could delegate access to this bucket to public internet users or to specific AWS users. In this case, I know that I want the default, so I'll just go ahead and hit create. Now we can see that I have a bucket. It's called Amazing Bucket 1. If I go ahead and click on it, you know, I'm prompted that the bucket is empty and I can upload new objects. I can also see what the properties and permissions were for this bucket. If I go ahead and hit upload, I see that in the management console, I have the ability to drag and drop files and to modify the permissions on those files. But I would actually prefer to upload my, con my data using the AWS CLI. So here I have opened the terminal window and we can see that in this terminal window, uh, I'm in a folder called assets and I have a file called demo.txt. Let's take a quick peek at this file and we can see that it's a text file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this file over to my S3 bucket so I can access it later from my EC2 instances. I'll go ahead and use the S3 copy command to copy that demo.txt to an object that lives in amazing bucket one underneath the key hello.txt. So I've gone ahead and uploaded that data. I can also take the contents of a folder on my local machine and I can sync them using the sync command and the CLI will handily uh, take each of those files and check to see if it exists in the bucket and then if it doesn't it'll go ahead and upload it. So now we've uploaded code.zip and random.csv also to my bucket. If I go ahead now and I SSH into an EC2 instance we can go ahead and see that this instance has been provisioned with an IM role that gives it access to read any of the S3 buckets in my account. And let's go ahead and check to see from this EC2 instance what content is in that S3 amazing bucket one. So go ahead and do an AWS S3 LS on the S3 amazing one bucket and I'll make that recursive so it'll check through all the paths. And I see that I have these three files. So just like before, I can do that copy command, but now I do it in reverse by specifying the bucket name first. And I've copied that hello.txt out of my bucket. I can go ahead and do an ls on my local EC2 instance storage, and I see hello.txt. If I do a cat, I can peek at the file, and I can see that we have my text file downloaded. I can also do that sync command in reverse, so now I can sync the contents of amazing bucket one slash files to a local folder on my EC2 instance. And now I can see that I have a folder. The contents of that folder has those two files, code.zip and random.csv. So that really covers a, a simple getting started with S3 of putting data in and getting data back out. Let's switch back over to the management console and see uh, and refresh it. So now I should see that I have some files in my S3 bucket. These are the same files that I saw from the management console and in the AWS CLI. I go ahead and hit uh, hello.txt and I can see some options. So here I have the opportunity to change per properties and permissions on a per object basis and uh, I can see some of these attributes of this file. So that really covers getting started with the S3 service. In this video we've covered an introduction to S3 and some common use cases and in our demo we got to go hands-on with creating a bucket, copying files into our bucket, and then downloading those files from an EC2 instance. Hi, my name is Adam Becker. I've been at AWS for about three months now, and I'm responsible for technical training. As part of the team, um, I've contributed to uh, numerous class sessions and taught numerous courses. In this video, we're going to cover Amazon Glacier, uh, which is a service, a managed service by Amazon, and we're going to talk about use cases, a de provide a demonstration, and a service introduction. So let's get to it and learn about Amazon Glacier. Amazon Glacier falls into the storage service category that we offer here at AWS and Amazon. It is called Amazon Glacier, which is our data archiving solution. At AWS, our goal is to help you architect as optimally and cost-effectively as possible, which is one reason why we offer such a variety of storage service solutions. Amazon Glacier is our low-cost data archiving solution. It's designed for storing cold data, and that's data that's infrequently accessed, yet it must be retained for business or legal reasons. Unlike with Amazon S3, 
Glacier is not designed to store data that has been accessed frequently. Instead, it is designed for long-term storage at a low cost. This is what makes it ideal for archival storage of data that is in, accessed infrequently. Glacier also designed to provide an average annual durability of 11 nines for archive. By redundantly storing your data in multiple facilities and on multiple devices within each facility. Additionally, you can control access to data stored in Glacier by applying access policies to the vaults that store the archives. Amazon Glacier has three key terms that you should be familiar with. An archive is any project or object, uh, such as a photo, video, file, or document that you store in Glacier. It is the base unit of storage in Glacier. Each archive has its own unique ID and can also have a description if you choose. A vault is a container for storing archives. When you create a vault, you specify a vault name and a region in which you would like to create the vault. Vault access policies uh, determine who can and can't access the data stored in the vault as well as what operations users can and can't perform. You could create one vault access policy for each vault to manage permissions for that vault. You can also use a vault lock policy to make sure a vault can't be altered. Each vault can have one vault access policy and one vault lock policy attached to it. So how can you store and access data in Glacier? While Glacier is accessible via the AWS Management Console, only a few operations such as creating and deleting vaults or creating and managing archive policies are available this way. Almost all other operations require that you use these other solutions. You can leverage Glacier's REST API or AWS SDKs for Java or .NET to interact with Amazon Glacier via the AWS command line interface, the web, or an application. The data you archive with this method could come from anywhere that's accessible, including your data with Amazon S3. Additionally, you can automatically archive data from Amazon S3 into Glacier using lifecycle policies. These policies will archive the data to Glacier based on whatever rules you have specified, such as how long the data has been stored in S3 or a specific date range when the data was stored, such as archiving data by business quarter. You can also set up a lifecycle policy that leverages Amazon S3's versioning feature to archive data based on version. Here's one example of a lifecycle policy that moves data as it ages from Amazon S3 into Glacier before it has been finally deleted. Let's say a user uploads a video to your application and your application generates a thumbnail preview of the version of the video. This video preview is stored to Amazon S3 standard because the user will likely want to access it right away. But your usage data indicates that most thumbnail previews are never accessed after 30 days. So your lifecycle policy will automatically take these videos and move them into S3 standard infrequent access after 30 days. Then, once 30 days or more has elapsed, the preview will almost never be needed again. So then, it gets moved to Amazon Glacier. Once it's reached a full year age, it is then deleted. Then, if on an extremely rare occasion that preview is needed again, your application sees that the file is deleted and simply generates a new one. The important thing to see here is that once the video file is added to Amazon S3, your lifecycle policy handles all this movement automatically, saving you time and money. Let's talk restoration. If I want to restore the data in Glacier, it does differ from Amazon S3. Data retrieval for Glacier is in minutes and hours rather than milliseconds. There are three options for retrieving the data and with varying access times and costs. Bulk, standard, and expedited. As you can see on the slide, bulk retrievals are the lowest cost solution and are typically made within five to 12 hours. Standard retrievals cost more than the bulk, but less than expedited retrievals, and typically complete within three to five hours. Expedited retrievals have the highest cost of all three. However, these retrievals can typically complete within one to five minutes. Think of it as choosing what speed to ship a package and select the retrieval speed that's most cost-effective solution for your workloads. While Amazon S3 and Amazon Glacier are both object storage solutions that allow you to store an unlimited amount of data, 
there are some very critical differences between them that this chart outlines. Be careful when deciding which storage solution is correct for your needs. There are actually two very different services for storage needs. Amazon S3 is designed for frequent, low latency access to data, while Glacier is designed for low cost, low long-term storage of infrequently accessed data. S3's maximum item size is 5 terabytes. However, Glacier can store larger items, up to 40 terabytes in size. With Amazon S3's faster access to your data, the cost of storing each gigabyte is higher than the one with Glacier. In addition, while both S3 and Glacier have per request charges, S3 charges for put, copy, post, list, and get requests, while Glacier only charges per upload and retrieval request. Something else to keep in mind is because Glacier was designed for less frequent access to data, it costs more per retrieval than S3. As the request cost is higher and you also be charged more per gigabyte for the data that you do retrieve. Another important difference between S3 and Glacier is how data is encrypted. With both solutions you can securely store your data over HTTPS, but with Glacier any data archived there is encrypted by default. With S3 your application has to initiate the server-side encryption instead. By default, only you can access your data. You can enable and control access to your data in Amazon Glacier by using the AWS Identity and Access Management. You simply set up the AWS IAM policy that specifies which user. Amazon Glacier will handle the key management and protection for you. But if you need to manage your own keys, you can encrypt your data prior to uploading it to Glacier. And now for our demonstration. So during this demonstration, I'd like to take you through what the UI looks like on AWS through the management console. We begin our demonstration in the AWS management console. Focus your attention on the storage area. There you'll see S3, Elastic File Store, Glacier, and a storage gateway. For this demonstration, we'll be selecting Glacier. Brings us to the splash page. Let's create a vault. When I click Create Vault, it begins the wizard. The wizard enables me to select options in a very simple way and create the vault as quickly as possible. In this case, my region is pre-selected, and in this case it's Northern Virginia. I've selected a vault name that's very simple. I've called it Glacier Demo. But you can call it anything you'd like, up to 255 characters, and that can consist of numbers, letters, and symbols, but just no spaces. Click Next Step, and that gives you the ability to send event notifications. For example, if you're moving a backup from S3 in frequent access into Glacier, it will give you a notification once that job is complete. Or perhaps you're moving backups into the cloud. Whenever that job is complete and your vault is closed, you will get a notification. I get a chance to review my information before I click Submit. And there is my vault. Let's take a look at some of the things we can do with the vault. When I select the vault, I get several tabs here. First is details. That's simply a review of what the vault is, when it was created, and what region it resides. Notifications gives me the ability to go back to that SNS topic and subscribe to it or set it up so that I do get notifications in the future. Permissions, perhaps most important, gives me the ability to edit the policy document for the Glacier Vault. I am also able to enable Vault Lock. I can create, edit, and view the details about the policy in here as well. And I can create tags. Other options within this management console are settings and specifically data retrieval settings. I can set and manage my retrieval costs by inducing limits on my environment. Free tier, max retrieval rate, and no retrieval limit. Since 2007, San Francisco-based ScribD has helped millions of users convert documents into web-readable format and share them across multiple platforms. 
They use Amazon Glacier to store snapshots of their databases, which they could use to restore a database if necessary. They also store log files in Glacier, since most log files aren't frequently accessed. Thanks to the money they've saved using Glacier, they're able to keep more comprehensive backups than they would otherwise. Take Biblioteca de Catalunya. It's a national library in Barcelona, Spain. They use Glacier to archive their older documents, audio, and video files, so that rarely needed materials can be stored cost-effectively. If someone needs those materials, they're still able to make them available in just a few minutes if necessary, or a few hours at a lower cost. They were previously using an on-premise data backup solution, but switching to Glacier saved them about 75% of their backup storage cost. What about Supercell? It's a game developer based in Finland. They're responsible for the successful games of Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, and Clash Royale. Maybe you've played those. These games attract tens of millions of players each day, who in turn generate more than 10 terabytes of game data, uh, game event data at each day. Supercell analyzes this data in real time using Amazon Kinesis, but as the data ages, they store it in Amazon Glacier. Later, when they'd like to get a more comprehensive long-term analysis of their event data, they can retrieve the data from Glacier's vault. In summary, I hope that you've learned a little something about Amazon Glacier. I'm Adam Becker with AWS Training and Certification. Thanks for watching. Welcome to an introduction to Amazon Relational Database Service, also known as Amazon RDS. Hi, I'm Andy Cummings with AWS Training and Certification. I have been with AWS for going on a year and a half now and I'm currently responsible for delivering live training events to AWS customers across North America. In this video, we'll focus on Amazon RDS. I'll lead with a quick service introduction and then dive a little deeper by providing an overview and use cases for Amazon RDS, and then wrap up with a summary of its main benefits. To best understand the major benefits of Amazon RDS, let's first take a look at the challenges of running a standalone relational database. When running your own relational database, you are responsible for several administrative tasks like server maintenance, software installation and patching, backups, and ensuring high availability, scalability planning, data security, and OS installation and patching. All of these tasks take resources away from other items on your to-do list and require expertise in several areas. In order to address the challenges that come with running your own relational database, AWS provides a service that sets up, operates, and scales a relational database without any ongoing administration. Amazon RDS provides cost-efficient and resizable capacity while automating time-consuming administrative tasks like the ones we previously covered. Amazon RDS frees you to focus on your application so you can give them the performance, high availability, security, and compatibility they need. With Amazon RDS, your primary focus becomes your data in optimizing your application. Amazon RDS manages operating system install and patching, database software installation and patching, automatic backups, and high availability. Scaling resources, managing power and servers, and performing maintenance is also covered by AWS. Offloading these operations to the managed Amazon RDS service reduces your operational workload and the costs associated with your relational database. Now let's go through a brief overview of the service and a few potential use cases. The basic building block of Amazon RDS is the database instance. A database instance is an isolated database environment that can contain multiple user-created databases and can be accessed by using the same tools and applications that you use with a standalone database instance. The resources found in a database instance are determined by its database instance class and the type of storage is dictated by the type of disks. Database instances and storage differ in performance characteristics and price, allowing you to tailor your performance and cost to the needs of your database. When you choose to create a database instance, you first have to specify which database engine to run. Amazon RDS currently supports six databases, MySQL, Amazon Aurora, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, and Oracle. You can run a database instance using the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud or VPC service. When you use an Amazon VPC, you have control over your virtual networking environment. You can select your own IP address range, create subnets, and configure routing and access control lists. The basic functionality of Amazon RDS is the same whether or not it is running in an Amazon VPC. 
Usually the database instance is isolated in a private subnet and is only made directly accessible to indicated application instances. Subnets in an Amazon VPC are associated with a single availability zone. So when you select the subnet, you are also choosing the availability zone or physical location for your database instance. One of the most powerful features of Amazon RDS is the ability to configure your database instance for high availability with a multi-AZ deployment. Once configured, Amazon RDS automatically generates a standby copy of the database instance in another availability zone within the same Amazon VPC. After seeding the database copy, transactions are synchronously replicated to the standby copy. Running a database instance with multi-AZ can enhance availability during planned system maintenance and help protect your databases against database instance failure and availability zone disruption. If the master database instance fails, Amazon RDS automatically brings the standby database instance online as the new master. Because of the synchronous replication, there should be no data loss. Because your applications reference the database by name using RDS DNS endpoint, you don't need to change anything in your application code to use the standby copy for failover. Amazon RDS also supports the creation of read replicas for MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, and Amazon Aurora. Updates made to the source database instance are asynchronously copied to the read replica instance. You can reduce the load on your source database instance by routing read queries from your applications to the read replica. Using read replicas, you can also scale out beyond the capacity constraints of a single database instance for read-heavy database workloads. Read replicas can also be promoted to become the master database instance. But due to the asynchronous replication, this requires manual action. Read replicas can be created in a different region than the master database. This feature can help satisfy disaster recovery requirements or cutting down on latency by directing reads to a read replica closer to the user. Amazon RDS is ideal for web and mobile applications that need a database with high throughput, massive storage scalability, and high availability. Since Amazon RDS does not have any licensing constraints, it perfectly fits the variable usage pattern of these applications. When it comes to small and large e-commerce businesses, Amazon RDS provides a flexible, secured, and low-cost database solution for online sales and retailing. Mobile and online games require a database platform with high throughput and availability. Amazon RDS manages the database infrastructure so game developers don't have to worry about provisioning, scaling, or monitoring database servers. All right, let's summarize this service by going over a few of the benefits in using Amazon RDS. Amazon RDS supports the most demanding database applications. You can choose between two SSD-backed storage options, one optimized for high-performance OLTP applications, and the other for cost-effective general-purpose use. With Amazon RDS, you can scale your database's compute and storage resources with no downtime and use the AWS Management Console, the Amazon RDS command line interface, or simple API calls to manage the service. Amazon RDS runs on the same highly reliable infrastructure used by other Amazon Web Services. It also lets you run your database instances in Amazon VPC, which provides you with control and security. Remember that every AWS service that you learn about is another tool to build solutions. The more tools you can bring to the table, the more powerful you become. I'm Andy Cummings with AWS Training and Certification. Thank you for watching. Welcome to this introductory course on Amazon DynamoDB. My name is Rudy Valdez, and I'm the Director of Solutions Architecture and Training and Certification within Amazon Web Services. In this video, we'll be introducing the Amazon DynamoDB service by reviewing its features, as well as use cases for NoSQL data stores. I'll also demonstrate how to create an Amazon DynamoDB table and new items and then how to retrieve the data using query and scan operations. Let's get started. Amazon DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service. Amazon manages all of the underlying data infrastructure for this service and redundantly stores data across multiple facilities within an AWS region as part of the fault-tolerant architecture of the service. 
With DynamoDB, you can create tables and items. You can add items to a table. The service automatically partitions your data and adds table storage to meet the workload requirements. There is no practical limit on the number of items you can store in a table. For instance, some customers have production tables that contain billions of items. One of the benefits of a NoSQL database is that items in the same table may have different attributes. This gives you the flexibility to add attributes as your application evolves. You can have newer format items stored side by side with older format items in the same table without needing to perform schema migrations. As your application becomes more popular and as users continue to interact with it, your storage can grow with your application's needs. All of the data in DynamoDB is stored on solid state drives and its simple query language allows for consistent, low latency query performance. In addition to scaling storage, DynamoDB also allows you to provision the amount of read or write throughput you need for your table. As the number of application users grow, DynamoDB tables can be scaled to handle the increased numbers of read and write requests with manual provisioning. Alternatively, you can enable auto-scaling so DynamoDB monitors the load on the table and automatically increases or decreases the provision throughput. The ability to scale your tables in terms of both storage and provision throughput makes Amazon DynamoDB a good fit for structured data from the web, mobile, and Internet of Things applications. For instance, you may have a large number of clients continuously generating data and making large numbers of requests per second. In this case, the throughput scaling of DynamoDB allows consistent performance for your clients. DynamoDB is also used in latency-sensitive applications. The predictable query performance, even in large tables, makes it useful for cases where variable latency could cause significant impact to user experience or to business goals, such as ad tech or gaming. Table data is partitioned and indexed by primary key. There are two different ways of retrieving data from a DynamoDB table. In the first method, query operation takes advantage of the partitioning to effectively locate items by using the primary key. The second method is via a scan, which will allow you to locate items in the table by matching conditions on non-key attributes. This second method gives you flexibility to locate items by other attributes. However, the operation is less efficient as DynamoDB will scan through all the items in the table to find the ones that match your criteria. To take full advantage of query operations in DynamoDB, it's important to think about the key you use to uniquely identify items in a DynamoDB table. You can set up a simple primary key based on single attribute of the data values with a uniform distribution, such as a GUID or other random identifiers. For example, if you were to model a table with products, you could use some attributes such as the product ID. Alternatively, you can specify a compound key which will be composed of a partition key and a secondary key. In this example, if I was to have a table with books, I might use the combination of author and title to uniquely identify table items. This could be useful if you expect to frequently look at books by author, since then you could use query. Let's switch to a demo where I'll create a new DynamoDB table and an item and then use query and scan operations to retrieve the data. So here I am in the Amazon DynamoDB section of the AWS Management Console. I can see in the upper corner the organ region is selected. This means that any tables that I create will be deployed to the organ region. I'm going to go ahead and create a new DynamoDB table. The first parameter that I'm asked for is the table name. This table will hold information about books, so we'll call it the books table. The next thing I have to specify is a partition key. As I mentioned earlier, DynamoDB is going to partition and index the data by partition key. I could use something like a book ID here, but in this case, I know that I'm going to be frequently looking up the books by author. Therefore, I'd like to set this to be author in order to ensure that my primary field is indexed for fast retrieval. However, an individual author can, in fact, author more than one book in my table. So author won't uniquely identify the items that I need to store. I'm going to use a compound key instead by adding a sort key. 
Now this combination of author and title can uniquely identify each book in my table. The next set of decisions that I need to make is around whether I want to use auto-scaling or manually provision throughput, and if I want to define any secondary indices on the table. For this demo, I'm going to use the default settings. This will allow DynamoDB to automatically monitor the table and set the read and write throughput accordingly. And there's the new table. The table is called Books, and the primary key is Author, and the search key is Title. Let me now go ahead and take a quick look at the top bar here. I can see the items in the table, and I also have the ability to check my metrics, create indices, and perform other operations on the table. I'm going to go ahead and check the items in the table. Because this is a brand new table, I don't have any data. So I'll add a data item. When I click Create Item, I see that DynamoDB has automatically filled out a template for what this item should have based on the primary key that I determined earlier. In this demonstration, I have author and title available. Now I'll go ahead and add a book by H.G. Wells called The Time Machine. The next thing that I can do is add additional attributes to this item. The flexibility to have items in the table with different attributes is really useful, and the flexible schema allows developers to evolve the table utilization as the application requirements change. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a set of strings for addition so that I can keep track of different editions of this book, such as Audible or Kindle versions. The last piece of this to change is the representation in this wizard from a tree over to text. I see a JSON-style declaration of the items in the table. I can add as many attributes to this JSON definition or to the tree as long as the overall size fits within the maximum size of a DynamoDB item of 400 kilobytes. When I hit Save, it commits the items to the data store, and I see that I have a new item, the author H.G. Wells. The title is Time Machine, and I also have the different editions for this item. I'm going to take a quick moment to pause and load a little bit more data into the table. OK. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the table. And now I should see more items. So here I have author, title, rating, and additions. Note that not every item has the same set of attributes. That's really taking advantage of DynamoDB's flexibility, which allows you to have different attributes and different items. Although, remember, every single one of these items has to have both an author and a title, as those form the compound key I discussed earlier. All right. To quickly locate books in this table, I can use the query operation. When I use query operation, I must specify the value for the partition key. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and look for the books by H.G. Wells. I can optionally set filter criteria on the key, and I can choose whether I want the data to come back in ascending or descending order, based on the value of the sort key. When I hit Start Search, I see several results that come back for H.G. Wells. There are four different books here. This query operation is taking advantage of the fact that I know the partition key of the data to retrieve, and it matches the data very quickly. On the other hand, what if I don't know the author of the book that I want to look up? What if I want to find all of the different Audible books in my table, or filter on any other non-key attribute? In that case, I can use the scan operation. For example, I can go ahead and check for the additions of the books where the addition attribute contains Audible. I should find all of the Audible books in my data set. After pressing Start Search, I see several books have been returned. I can optionally add additional filters to only show items where a rating is greater than 3. With that, I see that four books were returned that have a rating higher than 3 and contain Audible additions. So now I've covered the basic operations of creating a table, loading data, and using both the query operation and scan operation to retrieve our data. In summary, Amazon DynamoDB is a managed NoSQL database service, which can be used as a data store for applications which need to scale to store large amounts of data, support high request volume, and require low latency query performance. For AWS Solutions Architecture and AWS Training and Certification, I'm Rudy Valdez. Thanks for watching.
Hello, and welcome to this Amazon Web Services introductory course about Amazon Redshift. My name is Mark Fye, and I've been with AWS for over four years in the role of Senior Technical Instructor on the AWS Training and Certification Team. Our courses cover a broad range of interest areas, serving audiences in the software developer community, operations and DevOps, security, networking, big data, data warehousing, analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and more. In this course, we will provide an introduction to Amazon Redshift, an overview of what it is and does, and discuss some of the common use cases for Redshift. We will conclude with a short demonstration so that you can see the service in action. Amazon Redshift is a fast, fully managed data warehouse that makes it simple and cost-effective to analyze all your data using standard SQL and your existing business intelligence tools. It allows you to run complex analytic queries against petabytes of structured data using sophisticated query optimization, columnar storage on high-performance local disks, and massively parallel query execution. Most results come back in seconds. Now let's review a slightly more detailed exploration of Amazon Redshift's key features and some common use cases. Redshift employs a massively parallel processing architecture, coupled with columnar storage and automatic compression to deliver very fast query performance over petabyte-sized data sets. As is true with nearly all AWS services, you only pay for what you use. You can get started for as little as 25 cents per hour, and at scale, Redshift delivers storage and processing for approximately $1,000 per terabyte per year, Again, about one-tenth the cost of traditional data warehouse solutions. Redshift Spectrum enables you to run queries against exabytes of data directly in Amazon S3. It is quite simple to automate most of the common administrative tasks to manage, monitor, and scale your Redshift cluster, freeing you up to focus on your data and business. Scalability is intrinsic in Redshift, and your cluster can be scaled up and down as your needs change with just a few clicks in the console. As always at Amazon Web Services, security is our most important consideration, and with Redshift it is built in, providing for strong encryption of your data, both at rest and in transit. Finally, Amazon Redshift is compatible with the tools you already know and use, supporting standard SQL and providing high-performance JDBC and ODBC connectors allows you to use the SQL clients and business intelligence tools of your choice. Turning our attention to some common use cases, many customers migrate their traditional enterprise data warehouses to Amazon Redshift with the primary goal of agility. Customers can start at whatever scale they want and experiment with their data without having to rely on complicated processes with their IT departments to procure and provision hardware and software. Big data customers have one thing in common, massive amounts of data that stretch their existing systems to a breaking point. Smaller customers typically don't have the money to purchase the amount of hardware and expertise to run these systems. With Amazon Redshift, they can get up and running quickly with their data warehouse at a comparatively low price point. As a managed service, Amazon Redshift takes care of many of the deployment and ongoing maintenance tasks that often require a database administrator freeing them up to focus on querying and analysis. Software-as-a-service customers are drawn to the scalable, easy-to-manage platform provided by Amazon Redshift. Some use the platform to provide analytic capabilities to their applications. Some deploy a cluster per customer and use tagging to help simplify management of their service level agreements and billing. I'll conduct a quick demo now so you can see just how easy it is to launch load some data, and run a query. Here we go. Hi, for this demonstration of Amazon Redshift, I am already logged into the AWS Management Console, and I'm at the Redshift dashboard. I want to go through a couple of screens to show you how easy it is to launch a Redshift cluster. You simply have to provide a cluster name. You can accept the default database name and port number. You have to define a master database user and provide an appropriate password for them. You then can specify the size and shape of your cluster. There are a variety of node types to choose from. You can select a single node cluster which is appropriate for simple 
development and experimentation. For production purposes, you'd want a multi-node with at least two nodes for data duplication. We show that here. We then make some networking choices And having made those networking and security group choices, the last thing to be done is to select a service role so that my Redshift cluster will have appropriate access, in this case, to S3. The Continue button brings us to a screen that shows us a summary of what we've selected. And if we're ready to launch, we can click on the Launch Cluster button. Redshift clusters typically take a few minutes to launch anywhere from five or six minutes for a small cluster up to perhaps as long as 10 or 15 minutes for larger clusters. I've already previously launched a cluster so that we can get on with our demonstration and here we see it. My first cluster is up and running. When I click on that cluster in the dashboard I have a wealth of information available to me and importantly the first piece of information that I'm going to require is down here you can see where I'm circling it this is my JDBC URL. So I'm going to select on that and copy that to my clipboard. I'm going to need that in just a moment when I configure my SQL client to connect. I've now launched SQL Workbench J, although I could have just as easily used almost any SQL client. This is the one that I happen to have installed on my laptop. So I have already populated the connection window with the appropriate URL here that we copied from that previous console screen that we just saw a moment ago. This then will connect us to the database and we are now ready to issue some SQL commands. I'm going to use a set of commands that come from um, a self-guided demonstration on our website. This is going to create a series of table definitions for a data set that has information about ticket sales um, to various shows and events. So here are a series of create table statements. I'll go ahead and execute that and we see that those seven create table statements all executed successfully. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to employ a series of copy commands that will copy publicly available data into those tables from data sets that reside out in S3. I need to do a simple replace to put my Redshift role in as the credentials. And having done that, I should now be able to execute these copy commands. In Redshift, the copy command is effectively a load command. So those copy commands are executing fairly quickly. We see that in just under 15 seconds we were able to load all of that data. And then one final step for our demonstration will be to actually query the data set, the data that we have there. And so have a set of queries. The first one is going to query a system table called PG Table Def that will tell us the table definitions. We'll then find the total sales on a particular date. This was January 5th of 2008. We'll find the top 10 buyers by quantity. And then we'll find those events that were in the 99.9th percentile in terms of all-time gross sales. Let's go ahead and execute those queries. And we now see down here in the bottom our results. Result 1 is from our first query, definition for the sales table. Result 2, 210 is the sum of all ticket sales for that particular date. Result 3 is my top 10 buyers by quantity. And result 4 is the events that are at the very top in terms of being 99.9th percentile all-time gross sales. There, of course, we see some favorites like Phantom of the Opera. In summary, Amazon Redshift is a fast, fully managed data warehouse service. I hope you learned a little something and will continue to explore other courses. I'm Mark Fai with AWS Training and Certification. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Kirsten Depart with AWS Training and Certification. 
Welcome to this introductory course on Amazon Aurora. I've been with Amazon for almost a year and a half now and I'm currently responsible for curriculum development within the training and certification organization. I'm going to begin this course with a quick overview of Amazon Aurora and some of the services key benefits and concepts. Then I'll run through a quick demonstration during which I'll illustrate how to set up an Amazon Aurora database in the AWS console. We'll wrap up with a quick use case showcasing a well-known company and the benefits it obtained as a result of its application of Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is a MySQL relational database engine that combines the speed and availability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of open source databases. So let's get started with a quick overview of Amazon Aurora and then we'll dig into some of the key concepts and features of this service. First, let's talk about some of the benefits of Amazon Aurora. It's fast, it's available, it offers approximately five times the performance of MySQL, as well as giving you high availability with just a few mouse clicks. Amazon Aurora is simple to set up and uses SQL queries that you may already use. It has drop-in compatibility with MySQL 5.6 using the InnoDB storage engine. Amazon Aurora is a pay-as-you-go service, ensuring that you only pay for the services and features that you're actually using. And finally, it's a managed service. It integrates with such features as database migration service, as well as the schema conversion tool, which can help you move your data set into Amazon Aurora seamlessly and with great alacrity. Let's take a minute to dig a little deeper into the last benefit we just discussed, the fact that Amazon Aurora is a managed service. So what do we mean exactly by that? And why should you care? Well, in a traditional on-premises database, the database administrator is responsible for everything from app and query optimization to standing up the hardware, patching the hardware, and setting up networking, powering, and HVAC. But if you move to a database running on Amazon EC2 instance, you no longer have to manage the underlying hardware or handle data center operations. However, you will still be responsible for patching the operating system and handling all software and backup operations. And if you set up your database on Amazon Relational Database Service, Amazon RDS, or Amazon Aurora, you free yourself from the heavy lifting. By moving to the cloud, you can automatically scale your database, enable high availability, manage backups, and perform patching so that you can focus on what really matters most, optimizing your application. But why use Amazon Aurora specifically over, say, running MySQL with Amazon RDS? A lot of that decision has to do with the high availability and resilient design that Amazon Aurora offers you. Amazon Aurora is highly available, storing six copies of your data across three availability zones with continuous backups to Amazon S3. Up to 15 read replicas can be used, ensuring that your data is not lost. Additionally, Amazon Aurora is designed for instant crash recovery in the event that your primary database becomes unhealthy. Unlike other databases, after a database crash, Amazon Aurora does not need to replay the redo log from the last database checkpoint. Instead, it performs this on every read operation. This reduces the restart time after a database crash to less than 60 seconds in most cases. Amazon Aurora has moved the buffer cache out of the database process and makes it available immediately at restart time. This prevents you from having to throttle access until the cache is repopulated to avoid brownouts. Now let's shift gears for a moment and take a look at Amazon Aurora in action. So here we are in the Amazon RDS console and I'm just going to launch an Aurora instance. Go to Instances and click to launch New Database Instance. You have a choice with database engines as always with RDS. We are going to choose Amazon Aurora and you can choose if you want to be compatible with MySQL or Postgres. On the next page you have to choose how large of a database instance you want. How much CPU, how much RAM? For now, I'll stick with the default. And also, you could have it deployed with a replication in a different availability zone or not. Then there are the basic database settings. Give the database a name. I'm calling it prod. And then specify a master username and password. Let me keep that simple. On the next page, we get to choose where our database will be. So in which VPC and which subnets within the VPC. Subnets is plural because of the multiple availability zone functionality. And we're going to check here if you want it to be publicly accessible or not. Probably not. If we know what availability zone it's in, we can specify or else leave it at no preference. And then we can choose to create a new or existing security group to apply to the database. 
This will, of course, limit the range of ports available to connect to the database. I'm going to create a new SG, since I currently don't have one. We can specify a cluster ID, if I want to, and also a database name within my own database server. I will have a database called Customers, and some basic database level settings. For instance, what port I'd like to connect on, what parameters I'd like to pass into the database setup, and for example, if I'd like to enforce that only SSL connection can be made to this database, this is where I can do that. I can choose to encrypt my database using a key drawn from our key management service. I can specify some other preferences about failover and monitoring options and so on. RDS is automatically backing the database up. I can select how long I would like to keep the backups, giving backup retention period a value between one day to 35 days. And I'm choosing about a week. Lastly, I get to choose if I want RDS to automatically upgrade me to new minor database or not. If I would like that to happen, I can specify what times I would like that to happen at. I am choosing Sunday at 2 a.m. And that's really it. When I click the button to launch the database instance, in a moment or two, I will have my new database up and running. RDS will give me the connection string and I would connect to it like any other database anywhere else. Before wrapping up this video, I want to end with a quick use case illustrating how one well-known company is using Amazon Aurora. In the past, Expedia was running into issues with their traditional databases. They required large, expensive systems consisting of hundreds of nodes and skyrocketing costs that did not scale well. By switching to Aurora, Expedia can scale out their database without experiencing a decrease in performance. Of course, the benefit of running at a lower cost was nice too. On average, Expedia ran approximately 25,000 inserts a second, peaking up to 70,000. While running this many inserts, Expedia was able to experience 30 millisecond average response time for write operations and 17 millisecond response times for read operations. All of this while processing one month of data. So in summary, Aurora is a highly available, easy to set, performant and cost effective managed relational database. I hope you learned a little something today and will continue to explore this and other AWS services. Again, I'm Kirsten Dupart with AWS Training and Certification. Thank you so much for watching. Hello, and welcome to this short introductory video on AWS Trusted Advisor. I'm Deepu Qureshi, and I've been working for Amazon Web Services for about six years. I'm part of the AWS support team, and what I do is work with customers on how to improve their experience. Also, as part of this video is Alex Buell, who is also a part of the AWS support team, who works as a software developer engineer for the Trusted Advisor team. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through an introduction of Trusted Advisor and provide you a little context by reviewing a relevant case study. Then we'll dig a little deeper into how the service works and wrap up with a quick demo that Alex will do and look at a concrete look on how you can improve your security, fault tolerance, performance, and cost saving using AWS Trusted Advisor. When you start your journey on AWS, it can be possible to keep track of your resources, but quickly your needs grow. And as your needs grow, your AWS accounts can have too many resources to keep track of. You can have orphaned resources, resources that are not optimized in terms of cost that are just sitting there like EIPs that are not attached to instances or volumes or snapshots that are unused and just wasting money. Additionally, you can also have resources that are not optimized for fault tolerance and performance and even security. All of these things are important, but it's tough to keep track with complexity. So here you have these resources that increase and as they increase, you need uh, something to keep track of them. And that's where Trusted Advisor comes in. And Trusted Advisor is a tool that gives best practices and checks all of your resources in your account to see if they're in accordance with those best practices. And it does this in four different categories, the categories being security, fault tolerance, performance, and cost optimization. And so this is just a dashboard of the Trusted Advisor console. Later, Alex will be giving you a demo. 
Uh, but this is showing that I can save a lot of money right now uh, if I just did the right things, uh, as you can see there. And there are also three different categories of checks. Red, which needs immediate action. Yellow, which warrants your investigation. And green, where you're a rock star and you're all set. Trusted Advisor, to date, has saved over $500 million in cost saving for customers and has given over 50 million recommendations to customers. So now that you know a little bit more about Trusted Advisor, let's look at a quick customer case study to give you a concrete example of how the service has been used in the past. Hangama is one of our AWS customers who has actually realized over 33% in monthly cost savings. They used a variety of checks, most notably the underutilized EC2 instances check, in which some of their development teams were over-provisioned in terms of their instance sizes and needed to right-size their instances and also eliminate waste with unused instances. In addition to their low utilization EC2 instances check, they also used the reserved instances and the EBS volumes check to make sure that they were using resources in an optimal way and saving costs. So how does Trusted Advisor work exactly? Trusted Advisor compares your accounts resources with established best practices and wins out data in the form of checks. Now, Trusted Advisor not only just surfaces these best practices in the form of a console, but also as an API. In addition to that, you can get notifications of specific checks when they are failing so that you can take action on them. You can also bring in automation because Trusted Advisor is integrated with CloudWatch events, which can use services like AWS Lambda, as targets so that you can take automatic actions and automate the optimization of your resources. So now let's look into a demo with Alex. Thanks, Tipu. My name is Alex. I've been with the Trusted Advisor team now in AWS for about three years. This right now is an overview and a presentation of the AWS console experience for the Trusted Advisor product. We can see the main landing page is the overall dashboard. As Tipo had mentioned, we see the breakdown for the different categories of types of checks, including security and cost optimization and performance. There's also a section that highlights recent changes in the overall check status. As well, we provide an announcement to make more visible any new checks and changes that have been released. Let's dive into a specific check. The service limits check is a very useful check to many customers because it allows customers to be able to see their usage versus their actual limit for many different services across AWS. This is broken down by region, and this allows customers to potentially make proactive requests to get service limit increases as they are getting close. This is very useful to AWS customers because it alerts them when they are getting close to the limit for that particular service. It then allows them to avoid potentially being interrupted with a new launch that is scheduled for their product and their customers. Another common category is the security category. This provides many different notifications from IAM-related issues, from old IAM keys that have not been necessarily changed or rotated as frequently, to also more recent security issues, such as access unintentional for resources. For example, recent cases involving AWS customers, any of them being able to access EBS or S3 or RDS instances owned by you and your company. These are also an example of a recent addition wherein they are automatically refreshed periodically for you. This allows you to receive more proactive notifications without necessarily having to make a refresh attempt to get new updates yourself manually. The fault tolerance category has a number of checks related to potential support cases that would be helped by being able to take action yourself directly instead of needing support from the service team. Some examples include recent Direct Connect best practices to avoid service outages, as well as other alerts and notification to manage and configure resources that are of concern, such as EC2 Windows with EC2 Config that updates you when potentially you might have a new version that is recommended for either security or performance needs. There is a preference page where you're allowed to set up email contacts to be able to get weekly notifications and summary of your account's status across all of the checks. We also have features that allow you to download reports of all checks or specific checks. These are in CSV or Excel format files. You can choose how to save and what to do with that data yourself locally. Finally, a key callout is the refresh-based functionality. Most checks have a refresh indicator 
which allows you to fetch new data and to get updates on the current status of all your resources. The timeline button right next to it gives an approximate age of how long ago the overall check had been refreshed. This is an indicator of how relevant this data is. By clicking on the refresh button, it launches Trusted Advisor to go and fetch and seek all the relevant data for all of your account's resources and provide them back for you. The refresh status gets updated when it is ready. Now a new feature we added and Tipu had mentioned was a CloudWatch Events rules. This is an example of a rule set up so that it is automatically listening to whenever Trusted Advisor actually processes a refresh. In this case, you can set up a Lambda function or some other activity to give notification or to take action related to specific checks and specific overall status changes. You are able to even set in rules specific for particular resources and relate them to your own organization. Finally, there is a tagging filter functionality wherein customers can enter specific tags related to the resources they have and all the relevant check results will be filtered for whether or not those tags exist. This has been a brief overview of the AWS Console Trusted Advisor experience going over some of its features and functionality. Tipu, I return it back to you. Thanks, Alex. In summary, Trusted Advisor can help you to optimize your costs, improve performance, improve fault tolerance, and implement security. I hope that you learned a little something and will continue to explore other videos. I'm Tipu Qureshi from the AWS support team, and Alex gave the demo, who is also from the AWS support team. Thank you for watching.